This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Are these stocks under-owned by institutional Wall Street? A lot of these companies talking about generative AI. With Lisa Mateo on markets. Investors just worried about the ongoing sales slump in China. And Michael Barr with news. A ship traveling through the Southern Red Sea has been attacked. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. You can see the sausage being made here. I'll tell you, we, we almost missed the opening of the show because we were talking Celtics basketball. I mean, that's what Lisa saved us. She said, hey, guys, the show's starting. Hello. We say good morning to you. Yeah, NVIDIA, we'll talk about it. We're all over it. But, Paul, I think Target is way more important. And just to give you a compare and contrast of this disaggregation I see in the economy, Paul Chanel reported, you know the Chanel, I mean, you know. Oh, Lisa's yeah, of course I do. Head to toe in Chanel. Yep. And the pricing is up 9%, and the unit sales were up 7%. And uh, Kriti Gupta, with a great report there, yep. just said, look, they may have to cut prices mm. to get traffic at Target. That's the divide yeah. in America. Yeah, looking at Target here. They missed a little bit on their on their revenue and their uh, uh, earnings there. Stock down 8% in pre-market trading there, Tom. But the company says, you know, the, the environment on the discretionary stuff in their stores is pretty tough. The consumers are yeah. holding on to their pocketbooks here they a little use, bit here. They use the CFA word tepid. Yes. I have no idea what tepid means. <laughs> I think tepid means business is slow and you, you know, typically you cut prices uh, when that happens. We say good morning on Apple CarPlay and Android. Also on YouTube, subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast. I'm not out on the live chat yet. I'll get out on that. Good morning to all of you around the world, across this nation, as we build this digital, it's a digital experiment. It's like it is. AI, it's an experiment. <laughs> exactly. Well, AI yeah. is gonna be in focus tonight, Tom. After the close, Carl Master, Tim Stenovic will be breaking down the uh, yeah. NVIDIA earnings as they cross the tape today, a little bit after four o'clock. Biggest email I got yesterday was Scarlett Johansson, Joe Hansen. Joe Hansen, right. I, I, which is it? I don't know. Joe Hansen. Joe, Joe Hansen. Hansen. I'm going with Lisa's. Girl. Okay. I thought she played left wing for the Rangers. <laughs> right. uh, but, you know, it's a big deal. And, and this, is, this is AI copyright issue. Yeah. Can, you know, what can you take? I mean, it's it content. Can you see him taking Lisa Mateo's voice? Oh, I can see AI doing oh, a boy. lot of things here. But <laughs> oh, content boy. creation, Tom, that's what the actors and the writers, that was one of the key it's topics copyright. they thought about. Right. Yeah, well, I know. I, I, don't, I don't even know why we're having this debate. But there it is. And, you know, we'll have some NVIDIA for you today. And. You know, really, the world's going to stop here at four, whatever, for that. Carol and Tim will have that for you uh, in the afternoon. We're in the Interactive Broker Studios with your Bloomberg Business Flash. Lisa Mateo, her real voice. You got it. Futures little change. After the S&P 500 hit yet another record high yesterday. Today, all eyes, you said it, yes, on NVIDIA. Investors waiting to see if those results match expectations. Now, the company expected to report a 243% revenue gain in its latest quarter. Those shares right now, they're about half a percent. Snowflake also reporting after the bell too. Those shares down tenth of a percent. That's a real company. It's Snowflake? Software, yes. Okay. <laughs> you gotta get to it. They're huge for that. And since we're talking earnings, you guys mentioned it. Target down eight percent right now. Comparable sales decline for the fourth quarter in a row. The retailer says it's gonna remain cautious about discretionary spending, demand for home products, appliances. That's saying soft, but apparel that's starting to improve a bit. Now on the retail side, we'll all. Also waiting results from William Sonoma, Petco, and TJX. To the bond market right now, the two-year yield 4.86%. That's up three basis points. A 10-year yield at 4.44%, up three basis points. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much. A lot of equity coverage. Let me get the sheet up here. They give me the blotter here. What, did you see the intern brought this up I know. this morning? Exactly. I think they're here. from they're from Lewis and Clark. In, in Portland, Oregon. Really? Okay. It's a beautiful campus. I know, it's that's like, what I you know, hear. Like, uh, they were Patagonia. Uh, I'm looking, Gina Martin Adams in the 9 o'clock hour. Yeah, I guess Ludlow. We don't know if we have him yet. Michael Purvis. Big. On the equity markets. Big. Gina Martin Adams, Lizanne Saunders, Michael Darde. And with that kind of lineup, we thought we'd start with economics. Um, Seema Shah uh, is, is scary good. It comes down to London School of Economics, her tour of duty at the Bank of England, with a huge concision about what's going on. Seema uh, with Principal, thank you so much for joining uh, this morning. Just to cut to the chase, Seema, do the central banks and particularly the Fed, do they have a cogent plan or are they making it up as they go? Hey Tom, that is, that is I think such a good question because you know we read, we, you know, we pour over where the comma is, has it moved 
what is their what is their indication? What are they thinking? How are they feeling? The truth is, is that they are digesting the economic data, the incoming stuff, just like we are. So I think it's right that they're making up as they go along. I mean, of course they have an idea, but they just have to respond to the data because it's just unfolding, and I don't think they have a clear idea of where things are going to right. go. In your England, there's been a lot of good research with respect to how hard it is to do this business in that as a general statement, the Bank of England and other forecasters simply were too pessimistic and that we got wrong on a fractional basis, on a tenth of a percentage point basis, that growthiness was better than we expected. Do you expect that to continue and that we'll underestimate growth among the three central banks? So look, it's possible. I think that, I mean, all, all central banks have had, actually maybe with the exception of the ECB, which seems like it's had a, a, a kind of a more successful forecasting um, ability over the last couple of years. But I think it's it should be getting a little bit more straightforward because I think the last couple of years have been very difficult for forecasters. And I'm going to put yeah. myself in there as well, because we've been living in, you know, typically analysts, <clears throat> we look at historic data, we use that to give us a guide forward. Uh, the thing that forecasters missed in the last couple of years is that actually the economy has been fundamentally changed by COVID. The normal reaction function, interest rate sensitivity, all very, very different. And I think it's only in the last 12 months or so that everyone has started to realise that there is maybe, you know, doing a comparison to 95 to 2007 just doesn't work as well anymore. Uh, but from here, we are starting to revert kind of normalisation uh, should be down the line and that should make forecasting a bit easier. So, Seema, here in, in the U.S., do you think this we are, in fact, today experiencing a soft landing for this economy? I think we're in the motions of a soft landing in the U.S. So, look, the data is fairly good. Look, we're downshifting, which is a positive thing. You, the last thing that we want is actually to see economic data continuing to accelerate because that, to me, uh, ends up in a hard landing later down the line. But I think the jury's still out. You know, we can't say definitively we've got the soft landing, we've achieved it, and we can be all victorious. Uh, we won't know for sure for a couple of months. And I do have worries of how the Fed genuinely lands it. I mean, let's say in the next few months, they've seen that inflation comes down, uh, they cut interest rates, they become they, they start that path. I worry that actually what's going to happen is that if you're a homeowner and you've been waiting on the sidelines, eager to move, but holding back because mortgage rates are so high, you're going to get right back into the market. You're going to ease financial conditions and you're going to see the market and the economy taking off. So I do worry about actually, can they do a soft landing? Can they achieve it for more than just a three to six month period? So I guess if if you're the Federal Reserve, you saw kind of January, February, March, some inflationary type of data come out. And then kind of, I guess in April reversed a little bit, we got a little bit of you know slowing down of inflation. So if you're the Federal Reserve, I guess you can make the argument that there's no reason for them to, to do anything other than wait. Exactly. I mean, I think after you've had, I mean, just basic maths just tells you that if you've had three months of hotter than expected inflation data, you at least need three months of inline inflation data before you can feel any kind of confidence of going back to what your initial um, plan was. But realistically, given the strength of the inflation data and the continued strength of the economy, uh, they probably want a few more months than just three months. Right. So, but as I said before, I think they are digesting the economic data. The the earnings numbers coming out from Target um, certainly right. very important in terms of figuring out where the consumer is, because that's obviously going to tie back and and help them uh, figure out what the next path is. Seaman, to take the first rate economist Ed Yardeni over to his market call, which is a bull market wrapped around his concept of a roaring twenties. To me, roaring twenties, either the twentieth century or the twenty first century is about a pop in nominal GDP. Do you at principle see a combination of real GDP and inflation that leads to an animal spirit that gets to Yardeni's roaring 20s? So it's an interesting question. I mean, I can see nominal GDP going up mainly because of AI and tech. The roaring 20s to me was about kind of joy on the consumer side, just that relief and, and wanting to um, enjoy life and, and spend it. And I think we've had that for the last couple of years. Whether or not that continues, I think is a very, very different question. And inflation is gonna play into this so much that if you have got higher inflation, of course, it boosts your nominal GDP, but consumers are already feeling that retrenchment. They are right. struggling with it. So I'm not sure that you can actually do that initial, that direct comparison to the 20s. Seema, thank you so much. Seema Shah, the principal group. Don't be a stranger, see us in New York, Seema.
uh, when you get over here. Uh, just uh, wonderful. Again, a lot of good equity coverage coming up here. Uh, we do this. I mean, I mean, Bitcoin seventy-two thousand traded off a little bit, seventy thousand right oh, now. Matt Damon's back in the office. I mean, this, <clears throat> that's the, all you need for Bitcoin to move higher. Well, yeah, you know, he's he's back. I haven't really had a sighting yet. He's yeah, in meetings. I know. He's, you know, he's, he's with important. I people. see his people though. You know, I mean, they're Michael Barr, you and me, we're just hanging out. You know. Yep. Not like Matt Miller. He gets in a little later and leaves a little bit earlier. You know. Yeah, sounds like Michael Barr yeah. with our news <laughs> in New York City. Here's Michael Barr. <laughs> Oh, Paul, Lisa, thank you very much. Ireland, Norway, and Spain announced they would recognize a Palestinian state. Israel condemned the move and recalled its ambassadors from Norway and Ireland. Growing support for Palestinian statehood, the U.S. backs a negotiated two-state solution. Ambassador to Qatar, Timmy Davis. The two-state solution uh, is the only answer. Uh, it is not a frivolous thing. It will take all of us to do it, uh, but we have to do it. Ambassador Davis spoke today at a security conference in Doha. More destructive tornadoes rattled the nation. A deadly outbreak in Iowa Tuesday is blamed for several deaths. Primary elections were held yesterday in Georgia, Idaho, Kentucky, and Oregon. In California, there was a special election for former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's old seat. State Representative Vince Fong won that race with about 60% of the vote over a fellow Republican Sheriff Mike Boudreau. That brings Republicans' slim majority in the House to 218. As for the presidential race, two states held primaries at that level. Both President Biden and former President Trump added to their delegate counts. But in Kentucky, Biden took just 71.3% of the vote. 17.9% of Democrats voted uncommitted. Biden fared better in Oregon with 88.2%. Former President Trump ran unopposed in Oregon and in Kentucky. He won with 84.9% of the vote. In Georgia, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis won the Democratic primary to hold on to her position. In her victory speech in Atlanta last night, Willis told supporters that the people have delivered a strong and powerful message. There is no one above the law in this country nor is there anyone beneath it. Willis will go up against Republican Courtney Kramer in November's election. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, Lisa. The guy stopped me on the street in X, and it was like wicked good. And he <laughs> said, all you guys do is talk about the Knicks. And now, folks, 40 seconds. Yeah. Celtics basketball. Oh. I mean, they played 780 basketball during the season. I mean, are, they're just like the best team in the league, right? They look very good. They they came through in overtime and boy, you got you got to give them the the due on that. And then tonight, oh my, Rangers, they're playing Carolina. Oh, this is going to be good. Uh, uh, it is. It's, I, I really wonder how many people there are engaged in the sport. I don't get in the zeitgeist that hockey's like basketball. I I mean, Paul help me here. I think, that, I, I think you know Playoff hockey, I Play think, is a, is a, is a okay. new level. I mean, regular season hockey, not so much, except for those they, they crazy diehard hockey fans. They're like fans, Formula but, One. They got to yeah. fix it. Yeah, I but mean, playoff hockey. So I, full disclosure, folks, I turned off the Formula One this weekend. Pharaoh chastised me. It was Italy. You know, it was like, you know, everything you'd expect. I well, turned it off. And morning. deservedly so, man, from uh, Mr. Pharaoh, man. It's some races you're not going to have. You should see. Do you know this thing where what, Ripley? Yeah. John stayed at that place. I, I mean, it's really? a bit, yeah, he's a huge. He's like all Capri. Stay with us, folks. Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And this Bloomberg Business Flash brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Discover the future trading with their next generation trading platform, IBKR Desktop. Download IBKR Desktop at IBKR.com slash desktop. All right, more Fed speak yesterday. Who gave more insight on interest rates. Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller said he needs to see more positive news on inflation before making cuts. The same feelings felt by the Fed's Susan Collins and Loretta Mester. Minutes of the last Fed policy meeting, those will be released later today so we'll keep an eye out for that we'll also get a reading on existing home sales futures right now still little changed over in Europe questions about when the Bank of England will start cutting interest rates the stock 600 uh, stock stocks Europe 600 slipped data show the UK inflation showed less than expected so the pound right now is stronger the pound at 127.16 we'll head over to the dollar at 104.782 over to the bond market the two-year yield 4.86 percent that's up three basis points a 10-year yield at 4.44 percent and that's up three basis points companies making news we'll start with Citigroup they've been fined nearly 80 million dollars by the UK after a London staffer's fat finger trade it caused a crash in European stocks back in 20 2022 and then finally Blackstone they plan to share ownership with more of its workers and buyouts that's starting with an equity link bonus yeah. to 18,000 <clears throat> employees in Copeland that is your Bloomberg business flash Tom and Paul Lisa thanks so much really valuable Paul I actually read every word of the Bloomberg write-up on the Citigroup fine because yeah. all of us have made trading errors yep their systems I mean they just reamed them <laughs> they they just said they caught part of the error, yep. but just part. Right. And it was just <clears throat> fat finger. I don't know. What I, I mean, it's just amazing. Systems. Baloney. I, the whole fat finger thing. I mean, I've done. Well, I, I trust me, know. folks. Line up the mistakes I've made. We don't have time. But the answer is baloney fat finger. Their <laughs> systems failed. And ha But how many thousands of trades did they process a day? And I mean, you have systems gajillions. in place. I mean, yeah, I know. it I know. used to be simple. The buy ticket was white what? and the sell <laughs> ticket was pink. Right. There's the system. Right. You match, you literally <clears throat> match them up. Yeah. And, that's and we we'll have to see. Okay. The only one that we know that remembers this is Jay Hatfield. We're thrilled that he could join us right now. Uh, infrastructure capital management here. And Jay, I got like 18 questions, but I've got to go to one single sentence in your note that jumps out to all of the cautious people out there. We project a $2 trillion liquidity injection from global central banks. What happens after that? Okay, so we get a pop in the summer, buy in May and go away. What happens after the liquidity injection? Uh, well, thanks, Tom and Paul, for having me on. Well, that's, I mean, that's certainly a relevant question because it will reflate the world economy. But we're actually more negative about the world economy than your prior guest. And specifically, we see weakening in the US. And keep in mind, we've been hyper bullish about the US economy for three years. But the reason we were bullish is we had a shortage of autos and housing, because those are the sector, the hyper uh, cyclical sectors that break down. And we already saw uh, a weakness in auto sales last month. Uh, housing starts are starting to decline, which makes sense with rates over seven. And the rest of the world, if you really look at them, they're in a major recession without the U.S. So the strength of Europe is the U.S. because their net exports are surging, mostly because their, um, their domestic uh, imports are down. But the, the U.S. continues to, to um, have demand. So we don't think that that will spark another <coughs> wave of inflation just because we have a weakening global economy. And those cuts are required and the liquidity injections required to reduce the rates. But given that backdrop, um, again, looking at your notes, you reiterate your S&P target of 57.50 based on AI boom and increased conviction on global summer rate cuts. So the Fed's gonna be there for us and earnings are gonna be there for us. What are you looking for from NVIDIA today after the close? Because I know that's <clears throat> you guys are in those big four, you're all in on AI. Yeah, so we're a little bit cautious about the report. So we've been hyper long. I was looking at our hedge funds, like half of our return for the year or something <laughs> like that. So we've been probably a little bit too long. So we took our position down by half because just the expectations are obviously sky you high. took your position of NVIDIA down by half? Uh, yes, just okay. as, a, as a risk reduction. We're right. bullish, but 
I think it's kind of maybe 60-40 that a stock actually goes up. They're going to beat and raise, but right. possibly by not enough. What did you do with the proceeds from your NVIDIA glory moment? <laughs> well, we I'm just... asking for a friend. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, I mean, the technical answer is we de we're running a little bit of leverage on our hedge funds, so we delevered. But you delevered. This is yeah, important. Yes. You delevered the trade. <laughs> right. Because the other thing is the market's going to be weak if NVIDIA is down. I mean, that's just no automatic. There's not much news coming. You can tell from the futures. So the market, whole market will be down if NVIDIA is down significantly t on uh, tonight. So, Tom, what, something that we don't talk enough about probably is preferred stocks. Until yeah, this Chris guy comes Whalen in. Chris sends me hate notes. I know. Until yeah. <laughs> Jay comes in there to you. Talk to us about why you guys invest in preferreds and, and what are you doing today mm -hmm. in that space? Well, we kind of, we actually love preferred stocks. We're probably the only people in the world that, <laughs> that's true. But, <laughs> but we made a ton of money in, um, in most of our capital, really, in 09, because what happens with preferreds are they're really good companies, public companies who issue preferreds that have good credit ratings. But preferreds trade in the stock exchange, and retail investors dump them when there's problems. And during the financial crisis, they did they dumped them to insane levels. In this crisis, they've come down. But we haven't had any defaults in our fund. There haven't been a lot of defaults. It has very low default rate. So it's kind of an easy trade that you buy them when they're well below par. You get really good yields. Our fund yields over 9%. So you got a JP Morgan 6% mm -hmm. preferred. It's a popular JP mm -hmm. Morgan. I sound like, good morning, Chris Whalen. So you buy, you get a 6% coupon. Mm -hmm. Do you trade it for gain or do you just, is it just a 6% flow? Well, you know, it's, it's a, it's, you're not supposed to have a favorite child, but it's my favorite fund <laughs> because it's really easy. So NVIDIA, you know, we sold half, that could be a terrible trade. That could be up hundred points tomorrow. But when you sell a preferred above par that's callable at par, that's a good trade. It's not going to infinity. It's not a <clears throat> meme stock. So we're constantly, and, uh, and you need an active fund to do this, selling above par and then recycling. You mentioned yeah. the banks, like actually some really good regional banks came out with preferreds as seven and a half, M&T Bank. Um, M&T Bank has a seven and a half percent coupon. New issue, yes, they just good came morning, out. Good morning, Buffalo. So that's the answer to your, where the proceeds went, at least in terms of selling above par, and then we bought that Do you that look at issue. a preferred as a coupon or as an equity? Um, it's a hybrid between the two. So yeah, it has a little bit of interest rate in. risk, <laughs> and it has a little, it is fixed income, but it has a little bit of interest rate risk, and as I pointed out, some stock market risk, because it trades in the stock market, it goes down when this the market is, goes this down. This is the first time since Mark Haynes invented financial media that we've talked about <laughs> first. first. I know. <laughs> so, I mean, Jay, we think of you as one of our smarter guests, but you guys own Boston properties, office REITs. You gotta be kidding me. I can't give away stuff on Third Avenue right. here. Well, yes, that's definitely a contrarian call. There's a couple of elements to that, though, that people don't appreciate, and that is that obsolete business buildings are terrible. <clears throat> so bad elevators, you know, lack of uh, proper uh, cable connections, etc. But the A plus buildings, like this is maybe an A building we're in right now. No, we're A plus plus. <laughs> okay, you guys are A plus plus, but. The bananas There's, are fresh. Yeah, yeah the bananas are fresh. Bananas are fresh. Food, food is A plus plus for yeah. sure. Yeah. But there's actually a shortage of A++ type um, space. And if you're going right. to ask your employees to come back, you need A space. They're not going right. to come back yeah. to your... So you have to make that distinction. Boston Property is the leading company in the sector, all A's or A pluses. And there's one other bull case which people haven't focused on. They have a, some exposure to the West Coast, not as much as other funds. But the Supreme Court almost certainly is going to overturn the Ninth Circuit's ruling that you can't clear out homeless encampments from public spaces. So I think San Francisco and the West Coast are good long-term right. bets. Really? And there's some, you know, and AI is okay. filling up the, uh, the space over time. We're so at, that's where important. I want to go. you got to come back. Usually we're on like a 90-day cycle of guests. you got to come back soon just to talk about AI. Because Paul and I, we just don't get it. I mean, Lisa gets it, but we, you know, we don't. She's, she's Jay Hatfield, thank you. This is brilliant. Jay Hatfield there. That was outstanding, folks, on Preferreds. A nice primer. Good morning, Chris. Look at Chris Whalen in the tarp. Preferreds is, uh, well, red and green in the screen. NASDAQ with a little bit of a lift. Threatening 11. On VIX, 12.13. Lisa Mateo with a DXY call. DXY 104. 82 here. Churn a little bit of dollar strength. Euro yen, 169.48 from New York City. No, I'm not going to say NVIDIA Day. No, Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning. 
Bloomberg Surveillance is brought to you. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Little movement in futures. Let's get to the level. We have NASDAQ futures uh, at 18,805, the Dow 39,945, S&P at 5,339, all before the bell. The bond market, the two-year yield 4.86%, up three basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.44%, and that's up two basis points. Checking in with commodities, we have spot gold lower 2,414 an ounce. Brent crude, $82 a barrel. WTI crude, $78 a barrel. To our earnings we go, we're starting with Target. They're down 6%. Comparable sales declined for the fourth quarter in a row. You had demand for home products, appliances. That's saying soft, but apparel, that's starting to improve. And shares of Petco, they are soaring up 25%, reported better than expected first quarter results, and gave a forecast that beat 
estimates. Thank you, Tom, for your dogs for supporting that. Wow. Chinese on online retailer PDD Holdings, their ADRs are up to, they're up 7%. Sales beat estimates that was boosted by rapid expansion of its overseas offering of Temu. You remember those Super Bowl commercials. And a quick check of NVIDIA, who's reporting after the close today right now. Well, those shares, they are little changed. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. Yeah, my best delivery at home, the whole process is chewy. Chewy, I, chewy. It's I just see like, those boxes everywhere. They're boxes. People's porches. They, they make it. They <laughs> make know. it effortless to yeah. take my money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just incredible. So if you're in a commodity business, or Lisa, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Paul, can we both agree we're not going to say Nvidia Day? It's not, it's oh, not no, like yeah. CPI inflation no, day or Jobs Day. No, yeah, but it's we're not doing Nvidia. I'll tell day. you though, I. I can't wait it's to see how Carol they report. says that. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave it to Carol and Carol Masters. Yeah, she's got a T-shirt. It's Nvidia it. Day. Exactly. You know, it's they'll like, break it down. It's like sick. Anyways, um, commodities. You can't do commodities unless you go to a university that's steeped in commodities. And there's it's Macquarie. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing. I think it you right. are. I'm it's very you, Australian. I'll give you a pass on that. Yeah. Max Layton joins now. Drives a ship at Citigroup on commodities. Max, is is commodities like BHP Billiton and Rio Tinto? Is that like just gospel at Macquarie? Uh, no. I mean, I've got to say it wasn't. Uh, but uh, you know, when I moved to London, one of the areas where people were willing to hire an Aussie looking for a job with some, <laughs> with some uh, experience in economics and finance. <laughs> it happened to be commodities. That's great. Well, you, you know, and I, it's, so much, it's, it's just better to do commodities with an Australian accent. Yes. Max Layton, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg at Surveillance. Is copper real this time? Has there been a shift in the supply, a shift in the demand function where we have an embedded higher price in copper? you know what i think the investors have got it right they're predicting a bull market in copper and you know if they didn't push prices up to where they are today up 30 percent over the last three or four months then we would have had a massive deficit this year uh so you know investors have a track record of calling uh turns in in supply demand balances in markets like copper and you know i think they've got this one they've got this one right so i do think this is a start of a you know, the second secular bull market for copper that we've seen this century. Right. So we're going to have years and years of very wow. strong producer margins in this market. Do, do you have a shift in the commodity trend to finally a new up commodity cycle as Rushir Sharma canonized at Morgan Stanley years ago? Do we finally have a new commodity shift? Well, yeah, no, I mean, I can't get that far, right? Because if you look at the different drivers of the bull markets across some of the commodities, the individual commodities have had a great run this year, whether it's cocoa or copper or gold, you know, it's not particularly broad based and they're all pretty idiosyncratic. You know, I, I guess, unfortunately for commodities, fortunately for some commodities and not for others, the energy transition, China's, you know, absolutely throwing capex like crazy at the energy transition. That is going to be good for some and and bad for others, right? It's it's good for copper. It's not going to be great for oil. Um, and so I can't really call it a you know a broader commodity market. Certainly, there's been a you know some hope of a restocking in the manufacturing cycle. Many of our clients think that that's coming, especially in the U.S. over the next three four months. Uh, and that's, you know, stopped people into the trade, in, into putting something on in commodities like copper. But, so, uh, you know, I mean, I pause a bit there because, you yeah, know, maybe we can touch on why gold's a bit special. Well, we'll get uh, the gold. Not necessarily. Yeah. We'll get the gold in a little bit, but most of our listeners, most of our viewers, they care about chocolate. Cocoa, up 75% this year. Can you explain what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the cocoa works done by a colleague of mine, Akash Doshi, so he, he's all over it. But I mean, ultimately, I think we do have prices coming back down over the next six, 12 months. Um, you know, beyond that, I, I leave a lot of that to him. All right. So on the gold front here, um, you know, Mike McGlone here at Bloomberg Intelligence, him, his call for years is on commodities is buy gold and sell everything else. But what's what's kind of the gold play right here? Is it just... Chinese central bank, Chinese consumers buying up all the gold? Yeah, I'm really glad to kind of, you know, get on my soapbox on this one, have the opportunity to talk about it because 
this gold bull market is really different. I mean, it's really special. Like China, China retail is on the bid for gold at the highs, right? And Mike, in, in kind of 17, 18 years looking at commodities, I've never seen it before across any commodity that China is aggressively on the bid at the all-time highs in price. It, it's, it's, it's just kind of unheard of. And it's a combination of this massive retail demand in China, which is ultimately, you know, money that would have gone into property that is, you know, actually shifting into gold. You know, there's yeah. excess savings in the country. It's trapped in the country. Right. And people are not confident about the private sector. Household confidence pretty low. So it's right. going into gold. The Chinese imports in the first quarter were equal to two thirds of ex-China mine supply. So right. they're just mopping up the right. mine supply. You add to that the central right. bank demand, you know, on the de-dollarization right. theme and, and kind of polarization of the world. And, you know, the, what's left, you know, there's no mine supply left for jewelry, no mine supply. So you're really trying to, right. you know, squeeze out the jewelry demand. Right. You're trying to encourage the scrap. Right. Yeah, Max, pretty, I gotta get, uh, Max, I got to get in trouble with Jane Frazier this morning. Is Bitcoin a commodity? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I'm not sure. <laughs> Just the honest answer. Probably not. It okay. has some characteristics of a commodity, but it's, okay. it's a tough one. You're, you're, Max, don't be a stranger. Max Layton, thank you so much. Had a commodities research at Citigroup. Just love that. I love the conversation on gold. Yeah. Okay, we Segui right now over to surveillance. I should have bought more correspondent. Matthew Miller uh, joins us right now. Bitdog at 70,000, discuss. Well, you know, what's interesting you ask if it's a commodity because for a long time, I thought it was a currency. When I first started buying Bitcoin back in 2012 and talking to people in the community, that was the idea. Um, but it turns out people who spent it didn't make very good financial decisions. And so now no one uses it to actually buy things. Yeah. There was a time when I bought groceries with Bitcoin, when okay. I bought gas with Bitcoin. <laughs> I went into GameStop and bought a video game with Bitcoin really? uh, 10, 12 years ago. But I would like all that Bitcoin back. Would you buy GameStop <laughs> as a meme stock? I mean, are you? you no, know? I, you know, I don't buy stocks. Uh, in my role as a reporter, I feel it would be uh, unethical but at the time i thought of bitcoin as a commodity so i uh, as a currency so i just transferred my dollars into bitcoin and used it to spend for reporting purposes and now it's a for reporting store, purposes well, yeah, yeah, yeah of course yeah. now it's a store of value do you think um, or is it kind of like a it feels well, like it a certainly commodity has like been right yeah. uh, if you bought it at any time before <laughs> now you've made money so right and so folks just right. for full disclosure Matt does own some Bitcoin. We just don't know where it is. I know That's where the, it is. I just don't have the password. You don't have the key to get what? to it. Yes. Okay. It's a minuscule amount. but It's a, it's on a piece of paper um, that he puts somewhere. Really, like if you desk. lose your password, you don't? Yes. So with this piece of paper, they we're still like looking it for it within the Bloomberg offices. No. Exactly. No, no. So um, it's right. out there. He could be like on paper, like very right. wealthy. We just don't know. Uh, I, I got to talk one minute here, Matt uh, and Miller, about Hot Pursuits as well. Tell us awesome. about what you're doing with Hot I Pursuits. I really appreciate it. It's getting it. a huge buzz. Yeah. Your partner's out in L.A. like with a real job. Right? Hannah Elliott uh, covers <clears throat> luxury um, vehicles for us out in Los Angeles for Bloomberg Pursuits. And uh, I team up with her to talk every week about the latest in the world of cars. We have big CEOs on, like the CEO of Lamborghini, the CEO of Ducati. We have racers on, like Gunter Steiner <laughs> and Zach Brown. Yeah, but what are we Formula buying One. right now? What are we buying? What's a fancy car right now into the summer? What's a car when Lisa drives out to the Hamptons? To me, I, to me, I think Lisa needs a Mustang, a convertible yes. Mustang. The really? new generation, wow. I think, is a lot more muscular, a lot sharper. Oh, she's <laughs> and I'm looking forward to uh, interviewing Jim Farley in a couple of weeks Very out of Detroit. Cool. Nice. Matt Miller, it's great. Shave next time we see you. Matt Miller, thank you uh, so much. Look for him at 9 a.m. here on Bloomberg Television as well. And Hot Pursuits. Uh, it's okay. it, it, the reviews are it's really great. kind. It's, I mean, it's it awesome stuff. And Hannah Elliott is it. all over the globe yeah. uh, with her report. I mean, it's amazing. I'm driving a Nash Rambler and Michael Barr's driving a Pinto. We're a little bit behind. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Still dependable. Both Republicans and Democrats say they're worried about the potential for violence this election season. Bloomberg's Amy Morris reports from Washington. 
The latest Bloomberg News morning consult poll finds half of swing state voters say they're worried about violence surrounding the presidential election. The poll results suggest Republicans, Democrats, and even more independents have misgivings about how the race will be received by a polarized electorate. Six in ten swing state voters, mostly Democrats, are worried about misinformation. And almost half, mostly Republicans, expressed similar concerns about foreign interference. In Washington, Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Norway, Ireland, and Spain recognized a Palestinian state. Today's historic move drew condemnation from Israel and jubilation from the Palestinians. Israel ordered back its ambassadors from Norway and Ireland. Israel's foreign minister, Israel Katz, says that Ireland and Norway intend to send a message today to the Palestinians and the world terrorism pays. Meanwhile, the U.S. backs a negotiated two-state solution. Ambassador to Qatar, Timmy Davis. It does not give uh, support to the idea that the Palestinian or that Hamas did something that caused this good thing to happen. Uh, the United States and our partners uh, have been working um, in big ways and small ways on a two-state solution every day, uh, essentially for the last 80 years. Ambassador Davis spoke today at a security conference in Doha. Hunter Biden's lawyers will press a judge today to delay his trial that's set to begin next month in Los Angeles on charges that he schemed to avoid paying $1.4 million in taxes. President Joe Biden's son is seeking to push the June 20th trial date back until at least September, noting that he is also scheduled to stand trial in Delaware beginning June 3rd on federal firearms charges. He has pleaded not guilty to both indictments. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. <coughs> Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr. And this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, Lisa. Hey, Michael Barr, thanks so much. So what I did, Paul, last night, we just finished up with Ripley. And, you know, I know that America's watching. It's great. Pharaoh stayed at this place, you know, one of his trips to Capri or, or, yep, or whatever. Nice. I know. So I'm looking at a new one, and I don't even think I need to name the show because I don't want to, you know, influence people, but I'm really intrigued by this new show. I couldn't find it. I didn't have my phone. I didn't right. have the Internet with me. Finding stuff in this new world of streaming is impossible. You know what we need? We need a magazine that has less TV yeah. shows. Like what a shock. Something called like TV Guide. Like TV something Guide. Like what a shock. <laughs> I don't know. For it's, those of you younger, TV Guide is what your mother had to rest her martini on. Yes. Exactly. Manhattan. One of right. But you need it for the sport. Like when you're trying to figure out what game is on what yeah, I know, exactly. like, my husband said, he's like, okay, this game is on, what, okay, where, where do I watch it? it? Yep. Like, have is it you on seen, here, yeah, is it on here? Well, quickly here, Paul, have you ever seen the total cost all in of subscribing to every service Ooh. that wants our money? No, and I think, I, no, but I'm guessing, because there's, a, you know, countless streaming services out there well north of the typical $100 cable bill that people had back in the day. So um, it's- Unbelievable. I lived it last night. I could not find what I was uh, looking for. Just yep. crazy. We're out on uh, YouTube. Subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast, Bloomberg Surveillance.
Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg, uh, from the Bloomberg Business uh, Brokers and Broker, from the Blitz, three, three two, two, one, <laughs> go. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker <clears throat> Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Let's get to your futures. Dow futures down two tenths of a percent. S&P futures down a tenth of a percent. NASDAQ futures, they are little changed. So the bond market, the two-year yield at 4.87%. That's up four basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.46%, and that's up four basis points. Check of commodities. We have spot gold lower, 2,407 an ounce. Brent crude, $82 a barrel. WTI crude, $77 a barrel. Companies making news. TikTok, the information reporting it plans significant layoffs in its operations and marketing teams this week. And the animation studio behind the movies, Toy Story, Finding Nemo, cutting jobs as well. We're talking about Walt Disney's Pixar. It's laying off 175 employees. And sources say Barclays has told some of its U.S. workers to prepare to be in the office five days a week. Mm. Yes, and this is ahead of a new FINRA role for supervising work from home. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Hey, that's sort of serious. Yeah, it's, it's it's serious here. You know, it's like... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, really know what to make of it. I mean, yeah. it's like it's like May. Yep. I was sort of thinking August we'd we'd get these announcements. Yeah, the an, end of summer, come on back in the fall, kind Who's of. Who's going to be first to six days a week? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not funny, folks. Yes, we used to uh, live that as well. Bloomberg surveillance were brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Interactive Brokers they charge dollar margin loan rates from 5.83 percent to 6.83 percent rates. Subject to change, learn more at ibkr.com slash compare. And all of us, Michael Barr, Lisa Mateo, Paul Sweeney, and myself, we thank Interactive Brokers for real, real uh, commitment uh, to what we're doing here. We're saying it's not NVIDIA Day. Paul and I think there's other more important things going on. But nevertheless, how did we get here? How did we get to where, Invi I mean, NVIDIA, I have an NVIDIA thing in my computer at home. Really? And I upgraded to a better NVIDIA thing. thing. But I think it's just pretty graphics on the screen. It's not AI. But it, it I mean, now, I mean, this, literally a year ago, the company reported this huge revenue forecast lift in this quarter of last year uh, that just blew everybody out of the water in terms of the magnitude of increased revenue outlook, multiple billions profit, of dollars. Immediate profit. Yes, and they ascribed it to their customers buying more of NVIDIA's uh, chip designs specifically for AI. And that, I think, opened right. everybody's eyes, like myself, to say, oh, this thing is real. Real dollars are being spent by tech companies on this technology. And it's, you know, NVIDIA's obviously a direct beneficiary of that, but that just confirmed for a lot of, you know, non tech people like me that said, this is big so to me and, and, and folks you know carol and tim will do a great job on this this afternoon but the basic idea here when everything is said and done is they have x number of chips and there's y number of parties that all want those same chips right, right. so it's literally like a bidding war for their stuff and they got blackwell i think it's called coming out you know, this fall or something. Yeah, you know, but you see, you know, check. AMD is a stock over the past years up 50%, a Broadcom up 100%, so Qualcomm up 95% over the past year. So it's broadened out from just NVIDIA to a lot of the other tech names. And then, of course, the questions were being asked, okay, how else do I play this AI phenomena other than the chips? And then you started migrating into what are the software plays? Oh, Microsoft will certainly have a play, Chat G GPT, and so on and so forth. And so we're just yeah, starting to see these ripple effects of where does AI, and <clears> then for the Alex Steels of the world who focus on energy, energy became a play because guess what? For all these chip foundries and large language and server farms, all that, you're going to need energy at the point. Yeah, but the heart of the matter, and, and, and Paul and I chatted this up uh, before the start of the show, you have to believe in all the different types of AI. Yeah, and I'm not there yet. I'm full, not. You know, full, I'm not there on, on the on the kind of the practical applications <clears throat> of it. Other right. than it's just the latest iteration in technology. That's yeah. kind of how I think about it. Okay, uh, I'm gonna tell a story here. He's okay. gonna love this. So I'm at Michael's. Like this is like 15, 17 wow. years ago, and then you know they're giving me an overpriced salad in my third drink, 
and it's the art directors for my book. And they're like, Tom, we have to have an inside sleeve, one of your charts, 114 charts. Which chart would be like when you open the book, you see it, you know, inside the book cover sure. and that. And I made the decision like over the olive on the martini, I said, it's got to be Melpass. Yep. Mel passes at Bear Stearns, and out of all the people in the book, and these are heavyweight, Bill Dudley, the, the former Fed president, Bob, the New York Fed president, Mel Pass had the most amazing chart, which was yen and yen and gold, like what Dennis Gartman did. Joining us now, the former head of the World Bank and iconic at Bear Stearns, Mr. David Mel Pass as well. I just looked at yen and, and you, and credit to Dennis Gartman as well, it's the call of the decade weak yen that we saw, whether it's yen and gold or yen and, and whatever. How does Japan turn around this train wreck? Hi, Tom. Uh, you, you can stabilize your currency by having a good growth plan, so Japan's got to articulate that. Uh, they're not badly positioned in the world since people are, this, yeah. people are trying to diversify away from China, uh, and Japan has a lot of the things that people want. And so if they can retool the economy, uh, right. it, it, it can work. It's an experiment of reflation, which is pretty, you know, you're at Colorado College, and it's like, I you know, it's not even in the text. Books. <laughs> okay, it's an experiment in reflation, and they want to pull that back. Can they find a middle ground that works versus tripping into deflation again? They can, but they need to really think about their interest rates. You know, they're p pushing up against the 1% uh, limit yeah, on the 10-year bond. bond. It really yeah. doesn't. Uh, it d d doesn't work to say you're going to limit your bond yield, but you want the, your currency to stop weakening. So right now they're intervening to try to tide that over. That can work for a little while, but at some point you have right. to say your interest rates are going to be more similar to the rest of the world right. interest rates. Paul wants to jump in here. One more question on uh, yen. What is your call mm -hmm. on Japanese yen? I know you're not doing FX and market economists, but do you see a big figure strengthening in Japanese yen or more of the same? I, I think it could settle where it is now and the world would accept that. And that is a little bit what uh, what is going on. The world move, moves through right. currency realignments and then tries to stabilize after that and reduce the okay. harm from that. Paul, he's tanned and rested. Do you know notice this? He's left the fine. World Bank and he's, exactly. he's tanned and rested. I, I know. I'm very impressed. David, we've <clears> seen, <throat> bringing it back to the U.S. here, my entire career, we've been talking about annual deficits and the national debt, and now we even have Jamie Dimon, David Solomon, and Goldman Sachs talking about the national debt. We've even got that silly thing downtown where they tally up the national debt on a daily basis uh, for everybody to see. Is it time to care about that stuff? Like, I'm 60. I, do I care? I I think absolutely it is okay. time to care. It was one thing when the U.S. economy had a 50 percent debt to GDP ratio. You could borrow that and not really, uh, not really uh, uh, tax the world's capital or, or, or um, uh, take all of the world's capital. We're, we're the biggest economy and we're borrowing so much that it changes capital flows around the world. And I think it's doing it in a harmful way. It's the B government gets the first dibs on all capital, and then if there's any left over, big corporations get it through the bond market. Uh, and if there's any left over, which there isn't really, small businesses can borrow to fund their inventory, their working capital, uh, and countries outside the U.S. have a little bit of capital at the end of the line. That's not a workable system for the world. So I think there has to be both in the U.S. and in the world an urgency that the U.S. government stop growing it's spending. And this is, a, I, I guess, a political issue. I, uh, and again, in my lifetime, I've never seen the political will to address it because it doesn't sound very popular. That's, that's right. And I think there's a big gap in our law. You know, the debt limit law is misnamed. It's really the debt increase law. So every couple of years, presidents, both parties, uh, sign a law to increase the debt limit. I've, we have to replace it with something right. workable, strong, and it has to hurt Washington, not hurt the people of the country when, we're, when we have right. too much debt. David, you right? They you, shut you, the yeah. national parks rather than reduce Reducing the, the the staff hiring in D.C. The swamp gets bigger every time. Oh, listen time. to you. <laughs> every you time. leave the World Bank and yeah. it's a swamp now? <laughs> it's a you swamp. worked in the swamp for three years. What did you learn working in the swamp? Huh. Uh, 
so in this, so Washington is a swamp. The parts, all the parts work together to make Washington bigger and more profitable. That's that's a risk, and the World Bank is part of that. It's headquartered and uh, and centered in Washington. Um, one thing I learned, Tom, was how hard it is to get any other country to do the right thing. It's just as hard outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. as in, in the U.S. So if you right. take Nigeria, why is this oil-rich country so poor? They've got a huge extreme poverty rate. Why is that? Because the government takes all the, all the profits right. from oil and wastes it. This is uh, such a better mail pass than the yeah. World Bank where you had eight <laughs> people standing around looking at every... Word. Ruth David Melpass is public service to the nation and the world with the World Bank and uh, in, in involved in politics as well. I got to get back to what Paul talked about, which is the debt and deficit. Pete Peterson, Paul Songus, and many others led the charge on this. You were, uh, you've provided real leadership, intellectual leadership on this. And yet we always grew our way out of the problem. And Stiglitz has a little g, which is the growth rate. Are we now at a point? where the Stiglitz little g won't get it done? Yes, and I'm not sure, I don't accept that we always grew our way out of the problem. If you, if you think about what was happening in 2010, 11, 12, 13, the Fed was doing massive QE. You had this uh, tailwind from yields going down, uh, and so it was pumping up big cap stocks. The stock market is the moving halves. up. The halves were getting more. Yeah. Uh, but the actual <clears throat> median income growth rate wasn't good, wasn't enough. I think we crossed over the, the you know, the barrier or the, the harmful point uh, in, in the, early in that decade. Uh, and then we haven't looked back. The government spending growth just keeps uh, accelerating, not well, slowing I'm gonna down. Go, you know, Eugene Shirley 101, our smartest person on the debt and the deficit. We're going to run out of time here. Uh, Mr. Melpez, but let's do it right now. As far as I'm concerned, we've disaggregated into the world buying Chanel and the world buying Target. Target's down in flames today. I mean, the polarization here is tangible. Yeah, the inequality, and it's. It, I think it is the government's fault. They keep buying bonds. It's Why our we fault. We made the government. Okay, uh, but there's not a check and balance on, on the size of government, and we need one. We need to think that politicians are never going to voluntarily choose to limit the size of government. They're going to be part of the swamp that makes it bigger. Are you based in New York now, or are you out in 8,000 <laughs> square feet in, in the Rockies? I'm in D.C. It's You're got, still living yeah, in the swamp? Really, really nice bike trails. You know, the, it's the best government can buy. <laughs> Do you go to Ben's Chili Bowl up on U Street? I mean, come I, on, I can see you there. I know that good one. <laughs> okay, David Malpass, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us from the swamp uh, today. Paul, I think this is really important in that all these good people have talked about the debt and the deficit, and yet you look at just the interest that the government's paying now, and yeah. it's, it's a new dialogue that really hasn't been articulated. No, and, 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 and I, again, I just don't see the political will to uh, attack it because it just seems like everybody right. it's going to cost everybody in some way, shape, or form. We're going to reset here. We have a great, great uh, follow-on to Mr. Melpass, and this is the equity markets. Listen to this. Lizanne Saunders, Michael Darda, Gina Martin-Adams, and Michael Purvis on this crazy bull market uh, that we're in. We do this with all the focus on a small artificial intelligence stock. I guess we do that uh, this afternoon. A little wait to the, the How about the VIX? 12.18. I don't know. Did we get 11 yesterday? We'll have to see. Uh, futures at negative 10. Dow futures at negative 96. This is Bloomberg. Is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Apple's still minting more money than God, right? Geopolitics front and center for global Wall Street. With Lisa Mateo on markets. Stocks are coming off of another record high. And Michael Barr with news. U.S. Secretary of State discussed the conflict in Gaza. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. 
Good morning, everyone. Paul Sweeney, Tom Keen, Bloomberg Surveillance on an important day. A real a statement on technology to be made this afternoon. Carol Master, Tim Stavon, will uh, give that to you on NVIDIA uh, as well. We'll have some chit-chat on that. Is, do we, did we nail down Ed Ludlow or is he, is he uh, incognito? So know. far, it's Richard. I mean, you know, it's a little early out there. We'll, Self-driving car. We'll see. We'll wake him up. You know. You know, yeah. you know he sleeps in the Tesla sometimes. He does. He's got the. He's he takes the, the self-driving car. He's got we don't the self-driving car, and he self-drives himself over the Golden State to, Golden Gate Bridge. By the way, he did that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. We don't have that uh, luxury. Futures negative nine. VIX. Did we get an eleven VIX yesterday? I don't think so. Let me let me. I can do this, folks. V I X, index G I P two which is a two-day chart. Oh, you can I do this on the Bloomberg. Look at that. Yes, we got down to 11.84. Very cool. Yesterday. So it's a quiescent uh, market. Futures negative 10 as we wait this big event uh, this afternoon. We'll give you lots of equity perspective. Lizanne Saunders with us in a moment. We're on Apple CarPlay. We're on Android. We're on YouTube. Search Bloomberg Podcasts. Subscribe to Bloomberg Podcasts. And surveillance, Bloomberg Surveillance, Brought to you by Cone Resnick Advisory Assurance Tax. Cone Resnick can help your business quantify its financial exposure using risk based strategies and analytics. Visit coneresnick.com with our Bloomberg Business Flash, Lisa Mateo. Good morning and a quick shout out to the YouTube group. I am officially on the chat and nice. people don't Whoa. believe it's me. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, is that the real Lisa Mateo? <laughs> It is I'm going to type I'll it in here. I'll be chatting in today. Oh, so thank Lisa. you for all the shout outs this morning. Let's head to the markets. Right now we have Dow futures down two tenths of a percent. S&P futures down a tenth of a percent. We have Nasdaq futures, little change. Now this is after the S&P 500 hit yet another record high yesterday. Today though, yes, all eyes on NVIDIA. NVIDIA investors kind of waiting to see if those results uh, match expectations. The company expected to report a 243% revenue gain in its latest quarter. Their shares down about half, uh, half a fraction right now. Software maker Snowflake, they report after the bell. And if you remember, they made headlines that possible deal to buy Reka AI. Well, those talks have broken down, so it'll be interesting to things to see how things pan out there. Since we're talking earnings, let's head to Target down 8%. Comparable sales declined for the fourth quarter in a row. William Sonoma just came out, reported adjusted operating margin for the first quarter that beat estimates. Those shares, so they're down about a percent, so it could be Target kind of having an effect off of William Sonoma. And then shares of Petco up 17%, reported better than expected first quarter results. And since we're talking pets, Walmart Plus membership program, they're dipping into healthcare for pets, adding telehealth services for pets. It's a new benefit this year, Tom. You and Kenopi can jump on a call with a vet, oh make boy. things better there. Uh, there you go. You know, Easy you're, breezy. You're, I go, I go to the vet. I just make the check out to their prep school. You know, it's just it's a direct conduit. Lisa Mateo, thank you so much. Greatly uh, appreciate that. I'm looking here at the intellectual combine over at Schwab, and I got I got S and P tech sectors forward price to sales ratio pushing up against this all time high. Thank you, Kevin Gordon, for that wisdom. Joining us now, Lizanne Saunders has a privilege of working uh, with Kevin uh, Gordon. L Lizanne, you do the best charts on, you and Yuri and Timmer, do the best charts on Twitter today. What's your most important chart that you're putting out for Schwab right now? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um, there's so many. Uh, I, I think it's labor market data. I, I, I think it's it's, claims, continuing claims, what we see in the monthly right. jobs report. I, I think that's the needle mover in terms of, of Fed policy. Can you correlate uh, Target's earnings this morning and very great disappointment on revenue? Can you coordinate that, uh, with, cor cor correlate that, I should say, uh, with the labor market? Well, I, you know, I don't cover individual stocks, including yeah, I not covering uh, I, Target. But, yeah. but, you know, you have the, the earnings... Um, story this quarter uh, at the bottom line level has been better than expected, the beat rate, the percent by which companies have, have beaten. But you've got overall revenue growth down around in line with where inflation is. So it, it really has exposed the companies that actually do have pricing power and don't have pricing power. In addition, revenue beat rate has been below average. The percent by which companies have beaten on the top line has been below average. So I think this is increasingly yet again a, a sign of this by 
bifurcation happening, whether it's between nominal and real, high-end consumer and low-end consumer, um, services versus the good side, discretionary versus non-discretionary. And I think there's a reason why the consumer discretionary sector has been performing poorly, is we're, we're now seeing more than just cracks in, in the facade of the consumer. So, Lizanne, I guess the, one of the key issues here are the earnings that we have seen, and again, we're going to get another big one after the close tonight with NVIDIA. Have they been strong <laughs> enough to support this big move up in equity valuations that we've seen since October? Well, you've got about, I think the blended growth rate right now is 11%. That's inclusive of the companies that have yet to report. And that is well better than what was expected uh, at the beginning of reporting season. That, that, that's getting there, but I think earnings do need to continue to surprise on the upside because last year's strength in the market was all multiple expansion because you didn't have much in the way of, of earnings growth. So I think the earnings do have to play catch up. Obviously, the report out today is incredibly important, um, not just psychologically, which which we know it's going to be important psychologically. But if you look at the, the overall tech sector, uh, the earnings growth rate drops from about 24% or so, 23, 24% down to less than 11 excluding what is expected for NVIDIA. So it, it is it is obviously the, the poster child, but that has been the support for the tech sector, which is the overall support for a higher valuation level. If you look around the world, one of the mistakes that investors make is they do valuation comps country to country, region to region without taking into consideration what are the underlying drivers of the local yep. economy. And when you have more of an information tech-based economy that is support of all else equal of of a uh, higher uh, valuation backdrop the last thing i'd say is inflation as a backdrop for valuations is important maybe not coincidentally the sweet spot in terms of historical valuations being supported at a higher level has been in and around that two percent inflation zone we're obviously not there yet even if we're directionally heading in the right way lizanne what are some of the uh, the sectors that screen well for you and your team here yeah, so we relaunched Schwab Sector Views at the beginning of the year after a two-year hiatus for a whole variety of reasons. And we haven't had any change in terms of the sectors on which we have outperformed ratings since the beginning of the year. So it's financials, materials, and energy. Obviously, a very cyclical bias in terms of, of where our <clears throat> outperforms are. The two underperforms are REITs, maybe no surprise given the problems in commercial real estate, and then, as we already touched on, uh, consumer discretionary. Yeah. The rest are right. in that neutral category. Liz, how do you manage a bull market across the kitchen table? Okay. Sell in May and go away. That didn't work out. A lot, you know, there was a great chart. I, I don't know if, if young Gordon added it, Schwab, but you know, it's like we're getting back to you know 2006 ownership of equities, 60 some percent, whatever the number yeah. is. It's really great. We're all in on this market. How do you manage the emotion of a bull market on a kitchen table over a beverage of well, your you know, Tom, that's an interesting question because, uh, you know, household exposure to equities is a behavioral uh, measure of sentiment, um, for, for lack of a better word. But you've got attitudinal measures of sentiment. And one of the interesting things that has occurred in the last couple of years, really, in this sort of post-COVID bear market cycle is that you get much bigger swings in the attitudinal measures of sentiment than you do in the behavioral measures. So if you look at just AAII, American Association of Individual Investors, you can see pretty big moves in a very short period of time, up in percentage of bulls, up in percentage of bears, depending on the near term wiggles in the market, but you haven't seen much movement in that invested exposure piece of it. So I think that there is some complacency out there is measured by the uh, behavioral measures, but those attitudinal measures yeah. are swinging much more uh, quickly in this environment. What do you see at Schwab? What is cash doing? Mm. Well, I think for a lot of investors, cash is earning um, income. So you've got income and fixed income again. That's why I push back on this notion that the $6 trillion in money market funds is just sitting there ripe to jump into the equity market. I, I think that's probably fairly sticky. And I think it's great comfort, yeah. particularly for more conservative or older investors that had to stretch for yield and move right. out the risk spectrum <clears throat> to not have to uh, do that. Um, you've got implications for within the equity side, um, especially right. areas like you know, dividend stocks that um, will right. increase in, in attractiveness depending on what yields are doing. But I, I think a lot of that 
that sort of cash money is fairly sticky because it's earning a nice yield right. at this point. Lizanne, it was great having your assistant Kevin Gordon on, but you know you failed in one. Oh, thing. he's more than that, but we, yeah, we, he we is. And I love that interview. Well done, Tom. We were coming out of it, and I said to him casually, "I said, let's play some Nickelback." He didn't know who Nickelback was. Oh. The young lad oh, I, did not I know who Nickelback well. was. I taught him well, Tom. <laughs> he knows who Led Zeppelin is. So yes. glad uh, he you better know that if he wants to cash the paycheck. <laughs> Lizanne Saunders, working with the great Kevin Gordon at Schwab. Thank you so much. I can't say enough about their Twitter feed. Best in class. Speaking of best in class, with our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom. Paul, Lisa, Ireland, Norway, and Spain announced they would recognize a Palestinian state. Israel condemned the move and recalled its ambassadors from Norway and Ireland. Meanwhile, the U.S. backs a negotiated two-state solution. Ambassador to Qatar Timmy Davis spoke today at a security conference in Doha. The United States is dedicated to a two-state solution because anything less than that we think uh, remains as an ember of conflict. Ambassador Timmy Davis says, though, it does not give support to the idea that Hamas did something that caused this good thing to happen. Primary elections were held yesterday in Georgia, Idaho, Kentucky, and Oregon. As for Georgia, the key races to watch there were for the prosecutor and the judge in Donald Trump's election interference trial, and they both came up winners. Bloomberg's Ed Baxter has that part of the story. If Prosecutor Fannie Willis wins the general election in Atlanta's Fulton County, she will continue to prosecute the case. Willis last year obtained a sprawling, racketeering indictment against Trump and 18 others. Willis going in had a very hefty fundraising pot and has run on a campaign that the future of the county should not be controlled by self-interested politicians. The county usually votes heavily Democratic. Judge Scott McAfee won an uncontested race. He was randomly assigned to the Trump case by the court. Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. In California, there was a special election for former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's old seat. State Representative Vince Fong won that race with about 60 percent of the vote over a fellow Republican, Sheriff Mike Boudreaux. That brings the Republican slim majority in the House to 218. In Game 1 of the NBA East Finals, the Celtics beat the Pacers in overtime, 133-128. Global News, 24 hours a day, whenever you want it. With Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, Lisa. Hey, Michael Barr, thanks so much. Paul, I'm going to go into this quickly. I think it's really original. I use a WACC screen, a weighted average cost of capital screen, all the time. NVIDIA is a one-off. <laughs> They've happened so fast. In their defense, they really don't have a cash buildup. They're not like wait, wallowing in cash like Microsoft or Apple, but at the same time, they have a 54% return on invested <laughs> capital. I oh mean, folks, goodness. I've never seen this. I've never seen that. So, I mean, it's just, and their earnings have just exploded, Tom. Their free cash flow has exploded. Do they announce the a debt offering? I don't know. They can announce anything they want. They'd be here. like they four just... phone calls. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They call Michael Barr. He'll yep. go, I'll take some. Yeah, why not? <laughs> you know, Stuff away in the mattress. There's NVIDIA knowledge you can use on NVIDIA Day. Good morning, everyone, from New York. Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. We had more Fed speak yesterday. Gave some more insight on interest rates. Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller, he said he sees, he sees more positive news on inflation. He needs to see that before making some cuts. The same was said by the Fed's Susan Collins and Loretta Mester. Minutes from the Fed's last policy meeting, they'll be released later today. We'll also get a read on existing home sales, so stay tuned for that. As far as futures, Dow futures down two-tenths of a percent. S&P futures down a tenth of a percent. NASDAQ futures are little changed. Now, in Europe, the stock 600, it slipped. Data showed that the UK inflation showed slowed less than expected last month. We have the pound stronger at 127.19, and then we have the dollar at 104.87. As far as uh, the bond market, the two-year yield 4.86%, up three basis points. A 10-year yield at 4.45%, and that's up three basis points. And some tough news for Tesla, down 1%. European vehicle registrations, while well, they 2.3% year on year in April. That's to a 15 month low. And the clock ticking at BHP. The company has until 5 p.m. London time to make another offer for Anglo American or just walk away. And streaming services, not the only ones venturing into sports program. You can add social media apps to the list. Elon Musk's X Corp teaming up with the PGA Tour to bring you those real time highlights and videos. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa, thanks so much. What a great equity lineup we've got for you. Lizzie and Saunders just with us. Coming up, Gina Martin Adams and Michael Purvis. Now, Michael Darda, Roth Capital Partners. Uh, Michael Darda, thank you so much for joining us here. You call it a FOMO frenzy. Is our FOMO frenzy nothing more than the illusion of high nominal GDP? Thanks for having me on, Tom. Look, in the previous seg segment, I heard um, you guys talking about the fact that you know we've had a market driven in large measure by valuation expansion, and that's as essentially the definition of FOMO, if you will. Uh, so earnings are rising. You know the expectations are pretty lofty for the next year at 12% earnings growth, but if you look over the course of the past year, we've had about a 30% rise in the S&P 500. Uh, in earnings estimates are you know only up by about a third of that. So valuations have expanded and valuations are high on a historical basis, especially for the sectors that have been leading and dominating the S&P 500. Credit spreads are exceptionally low. Yeah, There's volatility. So we have a high level of complacency in risk markets and very lofty expectations for the Fed to be able to soft land this economy and for nothing essentially to go wrong. So, you know, we'll see how that plays out, but I, I'm a bit more nervous, obviously. So, Michael, we've had just came through an, an earnings cycle here that by most measures was pretty darn solid. And one could argue that it's been one of the key drivers of this market in 2024. How concerned are you for the economic backdrop supporting that because again we got some numbers out of target this morning that suggests the consumer um large parts of the consumer base out there is struggling yeah very good uh, point paul look you know we're starting to to see a more significant slowdown in parts of sales that have been super rapid uh through this cycle so in the most recent retail sales report sales of food services and drinking places that's the one read on the services sector that we get uh, in the retail sales data, you know, those numbers in nominal terms are now down in three of the last five months, you know, and this has been previously a double digit growth pace. So, you know, we do think the consumer is slow, slowing. Uh, our measures of excess savings are now gone. Yeah. And we're getting signs of incipient weakness in the labor market. I mean, yeah. Tom, I, you know, I, I know that you talk about the sham rule, uh, but you know, the DARTA rule is five tenths on the unemployment rate year to year, and we're there. I mean, that's something Okay, that's I'll, I'll give you that, but the basic core thesis here, Michael DARTA, that your legion of followers worldwide on YouTube, on Andrew, uh, Apple CarPlay, is the Fed to the rescue. What happens if they make four rate cuts, you know, out over X amount of time? Well, Tom, look, it really depends on the context, okay? You don't get four rate cuts unless <laughs> economy is losing steam and the Vixillian equilibrium interest rate is headed south. And so it's not necessarily something that is going to be associated with an ongoing melt up in risk assets. 
keep in mind, uh, we had 100 basis points of rate cuts going into the cycle peak in 2007. But right. The Fed was falling behind the curve. 150 basis points of rate cuts going into the cycle peak in bear market in 1990. So the real question here is, you know, does the Fed have the foresight and the timing to adjust policy rates in a way that preserves the business cycle and the soft landing. There's not a good track record there, but markets yeah. are super confident that they'll pull it off. I so mean, it's priced in if they pull right. it off. And if they don't, watch out below. I mean, the FOMO frenzy, Paul, uh, Sweeney, is just simple. You go north of Edgartown, just a little bit up by Tisbury, and you got literally <laughs> a shack you could bulldoze for 1.6 million. <laughs> that sounds I like mean, there's the FOMO frenzy. There's the FOMO. <laughs> so, Michael, are, are you in the camp that thinks that this Federal Reserve is already behind the curve here in terms of cutting rates that, in fact, if you look at some of the real-time inflation data, this Fed can begin cutting rates now? I think Fed Chair Powell is in an exceptionally difficult position here. You know, the, the Fed obviously had a two-year inflation overshoot that they did not anticipate or intend. And so one bit, once bitten, twice shy, if you will. So they really do want to be confident that um, – you know, that inflation is coming back down towards target, but inflation lags the business cycle. So if you're simply following those indicators, in particular on the services sector, you know, you're basically going to fall behind the curve. And I don't know that they can get out there in a preemptive fashion now, considering the nature of this business cycle with the previous yeah. overshoot. So it's tough. And look, if we are getting close to a cycle right. peak based on, you know, you know, the labor market losing steam, the unemployment rate moving up in a very late cycle fashion. Uh, ISM right. services for employment down now for in the last five months. So, you know, I think they're going to probably be reluctant right. to get going, you know, late summer into the fall. And I think they'll right. be behind the curve. Michael, so, nobody cares. Meg is out on live chat going, where are the damn Darta dogs? <laughs> I mean, that's all they care about. They just want a dog sighting. By Michael Michael Darda. I mean, you know, yeah. the, the different are the dogs with you. Klaus went into uh, early retirement, so uh, yeah. You know, if if you've a... seen if you've seen Michael Darda, the inflation at Chewy. Every time I go to buy dog food, it's like the grocery store. I mean, I'm sorry, Michael Darda. There's inflation in the system. Is that good for stocks or bad for stocks? Well, Tom, look, I mean, you know, you mentioned nominal growth. So on the way up when the Fed was really accommodative and everything was flying, obviously it was quite good. You know, now equity markets are really confident that, you know, the inflation storm is passed, the rate cycle is peaked, but that the economy won't fall into recession. So, you know, look, that's bullish if it all plays out, but it's price boom. And I think we need to be talking about tail risks and downside right. risks. We have a lot of complacency in risk markets here. Michael Darda, thank you so much. Uh, with Roth Capital uh, Partners, really, really appreciate it. This dovetail, like Yardeni, the dovetail of economics into market strategy. Like, not right. just like eco econobabble, but like, okay, what do you do? <laughs> you I, I got to Chewy.com. I mean, do you agree with me that well, Chewy.com is a life unto its own? <laughs> do, you, do you agree with me that the June 30 navel gaze has all been pushed forward? Like, I look at Memorial Day weekend sort of like, yeah. everybody's going to be like, okay, where do I want to be positioned? Maybe people have been up in the bull market. Now what? Yep. Maybe there's people who have missed all of this glory. They go, now what? I think there's a, now, a lot of now what going into Memorial Day. Well, I think that when we saw a little bit of in uh, year end 2023, uh, people trying to chase the indexes uh, here. And so far, we got the S&P 500 up about 11.5% yeah. this year. So uh, again, uh, it's it's broader than it was last year. That's what we hear from a lot of the strategists, and that's good for the marketplace. Right. But again, just uh, this fixation or not or this focus, let's call it, on Nvidia after the close yeah. today, uh, just kind of drives home that this is still a, a tech-driven market here, a uh, market driven <clears throat> yeah. by the technology sector, which I guess, given its market cap, uh, not surprising. No one's ever said this to me on live chat, YouTube. Subscribe. Hi, Lisa. Your delivery and cheerful demeanor greatly contribute to the show. Oh, Have geez, they ever said that, that about no, you or me? Nope. No. Nothing. <laughs> Lisa Mateo, she's out on live chat on YouTube. Look for that soon. Her people, her interns are helping her yeah, figure out exactly. how to she's do people. it. She's Features at negative 9 to VIX 12.17. From New York City, yes, on NVIDIA Day, good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. We've got red on the screen, Dow futures down two tenths of a percent at 39,019. We have S&P futures down a tenth of a percent at 5,335. NASDAQ futures are little change, 18,793. So the bond market, the two-year yield at 4.87%, up four basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.46%, that's up four basis points. Companies making news at Citigroup, the bank has been fine nearly $80 million by the UK, and this is after a London staffer's fat finger trade caused a crash in European stocks. That was back in 2022. And then Blackstone plans to share ownership with more of its workers in buyouts, starting with an equity link bonus to 18,000 employees at, Co at Copeland. And then shares of BuzzFeed, they're soaring up 55%. Former U.S. presidential wow. candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, he reported a 7.7% stake in the company. Now, if you base it on Tuesday's closing share price, worth about $6.8 million. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Look to what Lucas Shaw says about that. He's on fire. We got any new Paramount no. news? Uh, you know, like CBS no, no news? and that's and that in and of itself I mean, is the news. For, <laughs> the yeah. fact that there's no news. No, I'm asking for Margaret. I mean, yes. Margaret called me up and said, what's Lucas say? You know, what's Paul right. say? Right, exactly. You know, we'll, we'll, we're waiting to see what the Paramount uh, news is. We wait at 831 always for our economic data, a little light today. But the economic indicators, they're brought to you always by Commonwealth, supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business. Commonwealth, go where you grow. Visit Commonwealth.com to learn more. We thank Commonwealth for their leadership on uh, giving us the best of economic uh, data. Is, is NVIDIA economic data? I don't we'll think go, so. We'll go company data. Yeah. Yeah, company. Darter there. called it a FOMO frenzy. Is it an NVIDIA frenzy? Oh, boy. We'll see after the close tonight. We'll see how Joining us now, the worst job in Bloomberg. She has to sort through the 400 polls that are coming up before the first Tuesday of November. Laura Davison's deputy U.S. politics team lead and poll talent with Bloomberg <laughs> News. I'm already polled out, Laura, and my summary of all the different polls is the White House is making very clear they don't believe the polls. Do I have that right? Yes, Biden has repeatedly said that um, he thinks uh, that the polls are, are undercutting uh, him and, and underselling uh, his, his popularity. Um, you know, of course, polls are a snapshot in time and, you know, do have a margin in error and are just yeah. a, a tool that can tell us direction. But um, several polls, including, you know, oh, the, the month that we've done this Bloomberg Morning Console poll, as well as others, have shown that, that uh, Trump consistently leads him right. in these states. Is there a history that supports President Biden that the polls get it wrong and he'll do better than good the first Tuesday of November? So in uh, 2022, in the midterms, there was this big red wave projected, and that didn't materialize. So that is sort of what Biden is basing his, mm -hmm. uh, you know, his his hanging his hat on there of saying, look, you know, the, uh, the polls said we were going to lose before, and uh, we didn't end up, uh, you know, kind of with quite the shellacking we were expecting. But, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, a, a presidential polling is different. It is a little bit more precise than, uh, you know, congressional polling, uh, where you've got, you know, a bunch of different polls, uh, you know, across, uh, you know, hundreds of races. Uh, but this uh, is a consistent sign and a worrying sign for the Biden Can campaign you, that he... We're going to take a poll right now, Laura. <laughs> Lisa Mateo, jump in here. Lisa Mateo, have you ever been called to do a political poll? Never. Laura Davison, have you ever been called to do a political poll? Quite frequently, actually. <laughs> really? <laughs> Okay. I can't because I'm a journalist, but I get I get these calls, uh, you know, uh, probably five or six times over the past year. I've never been called. Me Paul? Nope. No, never. Thankfully, what, they know better. What, what, what I, see, I don't pick I, up I don't the phone unless I know who's calling me. So, Laura, so on this morning console poll, I know we've been doing it on a fairly consistent basis here. What are the latest highlights from this poll for us? So what this shows is that this is going to be a close race. Uh, Biden is performing best in these uh, blue wall states. So that's, you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. You know, he's he's uh, roughly tied there with Trump. It's in these southern states. Arizona um, has been one where he's been, uh, been trailing Trump. Uh, Georgia, North Carolina. Nevada has been a real wild card. Last month it showed that Biden was was down, you know, almost 10 percentage points. This month it shows that they're, they're nearly tied. So Nevada will be a weird one to watch. It's a very transient state. It's one that Democrats have consistently done well in, but, you know, it's really sort of a, a who knows this time. 
Well, here's the one that kind of got my attention from the Bloomberg reporting. Half of swing state voters fear violence around the U.S. election. Give us more on that. So this uh, was a, a uh, um, you know, a little, very much a sobering uh, realization here in the poll of that half of voters are expecting violence around the election. Um, I think we've already seen that, you know, sort of uh, those fears be fueled uh, with the campus protests um, in recent weeks, as well as, you know, sort of all of this, uh, the specter of 1968 that really hangs over the Democratic Convention that'll be in Chicago later this summer. Um, so this is, uh, you know, clearly something that's on voters' minds, obviously January 6th. Uh, you know, last election was not completely free from violence. Um, there are also voters are concerned about misinformation information. More than half of voters think that there will be misinformation that will interfere with the election. Also, foreign interference. That's a little bit uh, a smaller percentage uh, worry about that, but that's also on the mind of voters. What are we hearing or seeing in the polling about former President Trump and his uh, trial in New York City? Is that having any impact? And then I, I guess the other pending litigation as well. Is that impacting the numbers? So one thing is that voters are not differentiating between the various cases. They're not saying, oh, if one thing happens in the you know document case, I feel differently than if it happens in the you know the Stormy Daniels hush money case. They sort of lump them all together. But it's clearly on voters' minds. Um, the poll allows us to um, you know ask these open-ended questions where voters can just sort of share their thoughts. Um, the the legal case um, you know is one of the the top issues that people um, right. referenced in these open-ended questions. Of course, this was taken you know as uh, you know Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels were on the stand. Uh, so this was uh, you know clearly top mind in the news right. as well uh, but it looks like um you know we we asked a specific question a couple months ago looking at you know if right. trump is convicted does that change your opinion and it did laura is there a history this is sort of like a wendy schiller question up at brown do the candidates poll to figure out who the most efficacious vp candidate is do they like do a lot of work before a given presidential candidate says this is the one for vp so a traditional uh, presidential campaign does do a lot of work and polling. Uh, we also did uh, our own polling here on these uh, VP candidates that, that Trump is looking at. Uh, we don't have any indication that the the, the, by, that the Trump campaign is, is doing their own polling. Um, you know, Trump tends to go more on his gut and you know, no. making sure that these people are going to be loyal to him. Uh, but what we found is that you know a lot of the people that he's looking at, people like J.D. Vance, who's senator from Ohio, Doug Burgum, the governor of North Dakota, uh, nobody knows who they are. Uh, particularly in the swing states. So this is going to be... Yeah, but okay, okay, young Davison, I remember the moment where Bush selected Dan Quayle. Oh, boy. It was across a trading floor. <laughs> <laughs> the profanity that came out, Lord Davison across... Dan who? No <laughs> one knew, and it was, it was not appropriate for radio. I mean, Laura, I mean, it, does it really matter anymore? The VP you know, candidate? When you candidate like Trump who has basically a hundred percent name ID I'm not sure that the that the VP candidate is going to sway him one way or is you know going to sway voters one way or another you know Trump has talked about you know potentially picking a woman picking a person of color that could potentially help him with those groups although increasingly the chatter is you know right. picking someone who can help him raise money okay the great brief Lord Davison thank you so much we make jokes about it but she's just killing it down in Washington <laughs> uh, in the depths getting towards uh, this national election. Bloomberg Surveillance, well, we're always brought to you by BNY Mellon Insight. Let me spell that, I-N-S-I-T-E. BNY Mellon Insight, June 4 to 6, coming up in Nashville. Don't miss the essential event for the financial advice community. Visit insight.bnymellon.com, I-N-S-I-T-E, insight.bnymellon.com. Dot com. VP candidates. I mean, yep. you know, I, I do not recall when Nixon picked Spiro Agnew. No. If it was a time. shock. Yeah. I, I honestly can't remember. But no. I mean, there's a time, I guess, you know, you balance the ticket. You, you know, you try to bring in some support that maybe the, the presidential candidate does not enjoy at that time. But when I think when you have somebody like Donald Trump, who is Laura Davis was saying, has such high name recognition and has such... Uh, yeah. avid support from his supporters um, right. that it makes the VP pick maybe less right. relevant. The VIX, 12.17. We had an 11 print yesterday showing the, as Michael Darda said, FOMO frenzy uh, in the market. Somebody said, what's FOMO? Fear of missing out. Yep, See, I nailed that. Yeah, Thank boom. You. CFA jargon, sorry. Um, futures at negative 9, Dow futures at negative 74. With our news in New York City, Michael Darda.
Thank you very much, Tom, Paul, Lisa. Norway, Ireland, and Spain recognized a Palestinian state. Today's historic move drew condemnation from Israel and jubilation from the Palestinians. Bloomberg's Jumana Bersacci. The uh, Norwegian prime minister is saying that there could be no peace in the Middle East unless there is a recognition of a Palestinian state. Very symbolic coming from Norway. You will recall that in the early 90s, it was Norway that hosted those Oslo Accords, which were the first attempt at putting together a pathway towards peace between uh, Israel and Palestinian representatives, the PLO, at the time. Bloomberg's Jumana Bersenci. Israel ordered back its ambassadors from Norway and Ireland. Multiple people have died and at least a dozen were injured since a powerful tornado tore through a small Iowa town. The twister destroyed homes and businesses, shredded trees, and smashed cars. The tornado destroyed much of the small Iowa town of Greenfield. Iowa State Patrol Sergeant Alex Dinkla. We're looking at just making sure that we have everybody accounted for. Tuesday saw multiple tornadoes, giant hail, and heavy rain in several states. The NTSB will help investigate the sudden and severe turbulence that forced the emergency landing of a Singapore Airlines flight from London in Bangkok yesterday. There is at least one death and dozens of injuries. This passenger was on the flight. Honestly, I didn't understand at all the full scale of what happened until we landed the dents that were made in the overhead luggage compartments and all the additional kind of paneling of heads had literally pushed through and broken those plastic panels and there's blood. Today, Singapore Airlines CEO Go Chun Pong says his company is deeply saddened by the tragedy. A relief flight with 143 of the SQ321 passengers and crew members who were able to travel landed in Singapore this morning. It's believed the 73-year-old British man who died had a heart attack. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you wanted. With Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, Lisa. Are you ready for some football? In basketball, <laughs> there's John Tesh with NBC. I guess had a great song, Paul, help me with this, Round Ball Rock. Yeah. And it's sort of percolating <laughs> that NBC wants to re-record it in Nashville which means they've got a leg up on Warner Brothers Discovery TNT. I mean, that's what it's come down to. That's what the, John Tesh is doing. Exactly. So, and John Tesh revealed he's, you know, he's booked some recording time. He's booked his orchestra. He's ready to go. Uh, and then those that watch for the rights, which are uh, now TNT has them with Warner Brothers Discovery, maybe NBC might be getting back into the NBA game. That's kind of the speculation. So that was across the the, the media, I mean, it's just social about, media. It's yesterday. just about money. I mean, you know, they, they got yep. like 87 items, but it's just who's got the bigger wallet, yep. right? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. So um, there used to be a time when you preferred broadcast versus cable, but that's ir irrelevant these, these days. Now it's just a question of if you're the leagues, how do I... Uh, you know, include streaming into my package of distribution with my broadcast and cable partners. Remember that old commercial, you've got the time, we've got the beer? Yep. Well, that's exactly what's happening here with this. And you know, make, it's all about the money, like you said, Tom. Yep, so we'll see. But NBC rights, I mean, uh, NBA rights are right, you know, after the NFL, yep. a distant, distant second, but uh, uh, a number two as well is, is the NBA rights. And um, right. it's, it, they're extraordinarily valuable. And Was that the champagne of bottled beers? <laughs> Miller beer, man. Right. <laughs> Miller beer. We couldn't champagne. afford that. We had Utica Club. Which was a step below who? Jenny Cream. Yeah, who? You, <laughs> As you, in Utica, New York. You, 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 you had, it depended on you know, the level of brokenness into the weekend. You went from living a high, Jenny Cream Ale. Yep. Then you went to Jenny Beer. Nobody was talking the champagne of bottled beers. And then you went to UC, Utica Club. My mom sealed the deal with my dad by serving a beer called CB Wing. CB Wing, no, no. Yeah, and that's a cheap beer, man, but it worked. I, that's what I said. I'm like, but hey, I'm here. Okay. Is this, is, I don't know if we can do this on radio. Michael Barr, thank you for that information. Lisa Mateo's out on YouTube live chat. Good morning. Wow.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lise Mateo. We've got red and green on the screen. S&P futures and Dow futures down about a tenth of a percent. NASDAQ futures, they are little change. The bond market, the two-year yield at 4.87%, up three basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.45%, up three basis points. Check of commodities, we have spot gold lower, 2,411 an ounce. Brent crude, $82 a barrel. WTI crude, $77 a barrel. Companies making news, it's TikTok. The information reporting it plans significant significant layoffs in operations and marketing teams this week, so stay tuned for that. And then Walt Disney's Pixar, you know, the animation studio behind Toy Story, yeah, Finding Nemo. That. Yeah, they're cutting uh, jobs too, laying off 175 14%. people. Yeah, Disney, they're down two tenths of a percent. And finally, shares of Lululemon, they're falling down 4%. The company said its chief product officer is leaving the company. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. Oh, that's crushing news for me. I just can't, <laughs> can't believe it. Lululemon is slain. How are you doing out on live chat on YouTube? It's good. It's good. I'm I'm official now. I have the the little handle. The little so handle, yes. The blue and you know so, you're part of the yeah, team. Yeah, yeah. Pretty good. On live chat on YouTube, there's of course Odd Lots. It's a wonderful podcast. Joseph Weisenthal and Tracy Alloway. They join us now here as we drive forward. Tracy, you got to help me here because Joe. I mean, Joe's got the laptop out. He's up in the food court trading. I got on a, a blended moving average, GameStop from 12 <laughs> to 50, down to 22 in a long cup of co coffee. Who lost money on GameStop? You know what I'm kind of wondering since you mentioned Lululemon dropping just then? I'm wondering <laughs> which portfolio, the meme stock portfolio or the Becky portfolio full of like Lululemon and anthropology and Starbucks or whatever else, which one would have outperformed since COVID? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. that, I mean, if there, is this, I mean, you guys are focused on this, Joe. You're doing the meme stock thing. And yeah, that's right. We're doing know, the meme stock thing here. You know, it's fun. <laughs> What's different this time around versus the last time Odd Lots beat the meme stocks to death? Uh, yeah, well, we, 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 we crushed it last time. We crushed it this time. Um, you know, I think everyone's just, like, seen it before. Stuck culture, a little tired. It was very interesting and novel. And everyone's like, there's something here that people don't understand. Is there these value... And this time it's like we, it feels like we ran the entire story. It's like we fast forwarded to the end of the videotape really fast. Cause like, yeah, we know this story. We know how it ends. We know how it ends before. You might be able to right. make a little bit money front running the next person, but no one really seems to be so, under any illusions. That, well, like, it also feels much new. more cynical on that much note, more cyn right? Yeah. Like everyone kind of knows what they're doing. Whereas last yeah. time there was the whole narrative of apes together. So not the odd lots, who, not the odd lots the, who drive towards no. cynicism. That no, would never, never <laughs> happen. Between your two really eclectic backgrounds, should Gary Gensler step in to quote unquote control clowns in the meme stock area? Who wants to take this one? I will, I will give you my take, which is I, I will not offer advice to Gary Gensler, but this is my take. You listen, uh, so be nice. Okay. Um, I don't, you know, people should be able to do whatever they want with their money. If they want to gamble in stocks and pay over, sure. you know, go for it. The only people that I really dislike and loathe in this entire situation <laughs> are the people who pretend that buying GameStop or buying AMC is some sort of like revolutionary act where you're like sticking it to the man or like, doing, <laughs> it makes no sense. There's no like, there's no there there, right? It's the, the idea is like, oh, you're gonna buy GameStop is gonna be some populist act and overturn the elite <laughs> because like the, the Fed has some huge short position on GameStop and you're gonna like, come on. <laughs> and so like the only people who I think are like really like, contemptible in the whole, whole situation are those people but everyone else like if you want to gamble if you want to have fun if you want to like you know post your screenshots to wall street bets <laughs> of how much money you made or lost be my guest the most charitable interpretation of meme investing i think and the one that i sometimes subscribe to to make myself feel better is if you want to treat the stock market like a GoFundMe for mm -hmm. a business yeah, right. that you have feelings about whether it's gamestop or yeah, amc right. you have this sort of nostalgia associated with it then 
fine. I guess the most uncharitable uh, interpretation <laughs> of it would be stock manipulation, and that's where you get into the Gensler stuff. I will say every once in a while, I think about what it would be like if uh, the meme crowd came for commodities. Yep. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if you remember in the original meme stock uh, craze, 2021, there was some talk of going after silver. And right. I think there was like a tiny bit of a squeeze, but then it petered out. Sometimes I wonder what would happen then and whether feelings would start to change if suddenly people are squeezing, I don't know, the price of corn well, or we've something. Had oh, yeah. Huge moves in co uh, cocoa. That's huge right. moves in copper, huge moves in gold, coffee, silver, orange and juice. The commodities have been ripping, so who knows? But I, I just noted in meme stocks this time around, the amount of dollars actually right. being traded yeah. every day is really significant. So I'm always like, <laughs> Who the hell's no, trading this it's stuff? pretty wild that GameStop <laughs> basically got very or close, not quite to its highs from the yeah. last cycle from like nowhere. Yeah, but it's like it. that was like so fast. To, I do think like yeah, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say to provide wisdom on this. Sure. You know, I, I mean, he was shortlisted for the new coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Sheldon <laughs> Keefe is out, and they picked Craig Berube, which I get because of his work but with the, the Flyers Luke. and the Blues. But I'm sorry, Luke Kawa was shortlisted for that slot. Yeah. Toronto. What's he gonna add to this? I, mean, I don't know. I mean, mean I think Stock now that his now that his <laughs> career path of coaching the Toronto Maple Leafs has been cut off, I don't know what he's going to do, but apparently he has... Is we're he going to garden leave? <laughs> he's yeah. not. Well, I think he had about five minutes of garden so leave wait a between jobs. Is he still at UBS or does he leave UBS? He no, left. he's left. He's over at Sherwood Media now. Which is the new Robin Hood thing. Speaking so he's in the belly, belly of the, the belly of the meme stock bees, but he gets to write again. But now. the reason we want to talk to him is because I think he was the again. first person yeah. at Bloomberg to really dive into Wall Street bets yes. early, like a year before a year or two years before the meme stock craze yeah. took off. And then there are persistent rumors, and I plan on asking him about this when, when oh. we do the interview, that he is, in fact, a secret Wall Street Bets mod. So we'll Is that really that. a rumor that yeah. people spread? Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> if Tracy, I mean, I mean, you got to see Tracy's social feed. She's out with a damn dog in the garden. Have you ever been on garden leaf? No. Or like proper garden. I, I, I had a month. I Actually, go on I had a month leaf? before I came to Bloomberg, but I went to Guatemala. So oh. I guess that counts. But I wasn't actually gardening. Yeah. But I did have a fantastic idea for a book recently, which is a gardening book for financial professionals. Oh, that's in a good idea. I that's a great idea. So any book publishers out there, hit me up. I love I that could write idea. that. It really is sad that the only way to get any mm. time off once you become an adult, is to quit your job. <laughs> like, I really, like, you know, there's no such thing as a vacation while you're employed because you have to check your email. But if you quit your job, you actually get some time. So my advice to people whenever they get a new job right. is, like, maximize that time between jobs because, like, should, that's it. For my advice is work for Joe a firm that has, the, yeah, that has uh, work from home because that's the scam. Well, where are we going? I work from home. Barclays. <laughs> yes, no, right. I got yeah. one minute yeah. left. Barclays is saying, forget about it, five days a week. Are we going back to six days a week, work from office? <laughs> uh, no comment. What, it, what did they say? If you don't come to work on Saturday, don't even think about showing up on Sunday. Exactly. That's the line. I yeah. think that's where we're going back Does to. Light Sweet Crew have a summer tour worked up yet? We have we some shows it? June 21st, yes. someplace in Williamsburg, and I think we're playing at like, some like public garden June 8th and like, oh, deep in he's Brooklyn. so yeah. huge. <laughs> You know you've made it when you don't know where your next gig is. Your people, <laughs> some park, our people, our the, people have that for us. It's playing Central Park. <laughs> He's opening some park. I don't know. So, uh, it's supposed to be Central. Yeah. No. No. Opening Joe Weisenthal, thank you. Tracy Alloway, thank you. Seriously, folks, Luke Kawa, definitive on meme stocks. This is going to be an important odd lot uh, for global Wall Street. Look for that out there. We didn't even talk to them about Nvidia Day. No, I am. I'm, it's nuts. So they're coming back for Carol and uh, Tim. Probably. Oh, they're, yeah, they're probably you know, doing yep. another cameo here. Yep. You know, I, I, I get it. Okay. They'll be breaking the news at 4 o'clock. Odd lots. Look for that out there. Just a just a cue. Oh, oh, we put up the... You never put up my graphic for my podcast. <laughs> Ari, Ari puts up out on there. Uh, Lisa Mateo out on the live chat on uh, YouTube. This is a major... We like, like, you know, we're like on the edge of odd lots here. We're getting almost social like that. All right, I'm going to have to do this now. Figure out yeah. how that works. Uh, Euro yen, I got to go back to it, folks. This is something, it's like, it's off the radar here in 90 degree New York City, but 169.58. Euro yen is stronger euro, weaker yen. In, Paul, I'm sorry, we'll give it up. I, I guess it's not news until it is news, and it could be news uh, into any Japanese evening, particularly Friday and into Monday evening. Yeah, look at the, Monday morning, I should yeah, say, exactly. Sunday evening Japanese. Uh, dollar yen here, time 156.53. Remember, we got to that 160 <clears> level. <throat> 
a couple of weeks ago, and then I think you know the expect or the speculation or the belief right. in the marketplace was that the Bank of Japan stepped in here. Yeah, it's classic, Mr. Joel. I mean, you know, I mean, it's about everybody that's. You know, <laughs> we didn't start the fire. No. Good morning. Stay with us.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Why are we upset if we're creating jobs? Inflation is still a thing out there for the everyday consumer. With Lisa Mateo on markets. The economic calendar jam-packed today. And Michael Barr with news. Tensions between the U.S. and China have heated up even more. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Tom Keen, Paul Sweeney, fired up here. No, we're not going to call it NVIDIA Day. Gina Martin Adams will call it NVIDIA Day because that's the marketing that they're doing at Bloomberg Intelligence. I saw so, out on social media yeah. that Ed Ludlow's saying he's coming on our show this morning. He said that? Yes. Oh, I didn't so know that. I didn't, My people I didn't, didn't tell the, me that. I didn't hear from the people, Your but people he's, out there on so, he's out there on social saying he's going right. he to talk NVIDIA. How come you have three interns and Ooh, I have two I know, interns? I What's just, that about? You know, you know they're... You yeah, gotta keep them happy. It's just, it's just amazing. You just say, okay, you just come down to the beach, you know. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Paul Sweeney and Tom Keeney. A really interesting day here. Into Nvidia. Seriously, Carol and Tim will have all that for you this afternoon. The VIX 12.10. We're gonna do this quickly because we've got a guest here as we look equity driven this morning. Liz Ann Saunders uh, with us. Michael Darda, Michael Purvis coming up. Gina Martin Adams must listen in moment. Look for that out on YouTube. Subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast. Search. Bloomberg podcast and if you do that you get the live feed the live chat on YouTube with Lisa uh, Mateo that's pretty cool <laughs> Bloomberg surveillance this morning brought to you by BNY Mellon Insight June 4 to June 6 Nashville don't miss the essential event for the financial advice community visit insight insite insight.bnymellon.com with our Bloomberg Business Flash. She's on YouTube, Lisa Mateo. I am, and keep the comments coming this morning. All right, futures right now pointing to a steady open. Investors awaiting earnings from NVIDIA. You said it. It's results offering what you can say, I guess, is a grand finale to a surprisingly strong earnings season for big tech. Uh, those shares right now, they're up about half a percent. Retail, also in focus today. You have Target down 9%. Key measure of sales fell for the fourth consecutive quarter. Then you have William Sonoma, some better news there, up 8% reported adjusted operating margin for the first quarter that beat estimates. You have TJX up 1%, boosted its earnings per share forecast for the full year. Urban Outfitters, they're up 3%. They reported first quarter net sales that beat estimates. As far as the bond market, the two-year yield at 4.86%. That's up three basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.45%, and that's up three basis points. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa, thanks so much. Gina Martin-Adams joins driving all of our equity coverage in fundamentals, technicals, and economics uh, at Bloomberg Intelligence. Okay, Gina, I'm looking at SPX. Michael Dart is talking about FOMO frenzy and all this. I, I mean, I'm up 700% whatever since 2009, 14% per year on SPX since, you know, the horrific 2009 moment. And what I see more short term back to November of last year, the October lift that we had, is it in a fancy technical setup like ADX DMI, it's clear this is not about the buyers. It's asymmetric. There's no sellers out there. Yeah. Why are there no sellers out there? It's clear as a bell. Yeah, I th this is a really great point, and I think one that is incredibly important is you get to a point where everyone has already sold, and then it only takes an incremental buyer and or it takes continuous takeout of shares from companies in the form of buybacks. That's just simple supply and demand, which results in acceleration in share price. And I think we actually got there really all the way back in October 2022. It was confirmed again yes. with the sell off in October 2023, where it just wiped <clears throat> out everyone's confidence. We had the worst confidence scores in our market pulse index which when? is something that we use for sentiment this last october october 2022 october 22, so right. and it was worse in october 2022 than it was in the depths of the pandemic mm -hmm. as bad as it was in the great financial crisis right. and i do think that sentiment is what forms bottoms sentiment is always formed when the last seller has left the building those right. bottoms form and it, they form I, on a spike. They take everyone by surprise. But And you right. felt it. You feel it in the market. You see yeah. it in low vol performance. You see it in the characteristics of this market with the concentrated gains and just a few names as well. People are not getting back into stocks. And, and, nice. and Paul, what's so important in this discussion is every grizzled technical pro knows it's asymmetric. It's not just by, you know, the financial media shtick. It's you got to look at the buyers separate from the sellers. 
And right now, Wells Wilder's ADX DMI is telling me the sellers have walked <laughs> away. They're on strike. They're they're you know they're looking at Lisa on YouTube. It's Alex Steele. She says, "Hey, stocks want to go higher, and you know they're going to go higher." <laughs> yeah. And I said, "You're probably Fair. right." Exactly. <laughs> Gene, how about the earnings? Uh, do we have enough earnings momentum in this uh, market to support this market? Yeah, uh, so it depends on where you are in the world. Okay. I want to characterize for that. We do in the U.S. In the U.S. market, the earnings season was frankly quite phenomenal. I mean, it, we, much, much better than analysts were anticipating, and analysts are even now getting on board to the fundamental recovery. So from a U.S. perspective, we are seeing broadening of gains. We're seeing you know greater distribution of earnings growth across the index. Uh, analysts are even sort of finally capitulating <laughs> to the recovery process, at least in fits and starts. And for the U.S. bellwethers that we follow, we're looking at 20% growth in the first wow. quarter, so really extraordinary growth. Where we still see some weak pockets of weakness is really outside of the U.S., and I think that this is going to be a really big story for the rest of this year, is developed markets beat expectations very consistently, with the exception of Japan. Developed markets outside the U.S. also beat expectations, but their growth is still contracting at least from our bellwethers work where we look at the biggest stocks across markets. That is expected to clear over the course of 2024. By the end of 2024, those developed markets should be posting growth. Will we get that or not is a critical question. Emerging markets were also very, very weak in the first quarter. Some of this certainly reflects China, yep. but some of it is maybe analysts were a little too optimistic on emerging markets, which sets up a really d interesting contrast with the U.S. story where analysts are too pessimistic. Emerging markets are expected to really show some very strong growth over the rest of this year. Will they ultimately surpass growth in the U.S. is a huge question mark. They're expected to match U.S. growth for the rest of 2024. That puts a big onus on China and some of the rest of the emerging markets to really satisfy yep. those expectations. But it has resulted in some rotation into that group. And if we can get better growth coming out of emerging markets, we may see greater distribution of gains across global stocks over the course of 2024. What are the sectors or what are the factors that are really screening well for you guys these yeah. days? Yeah. So from a sector perspective, tech is still up there as yep. much as everybody says that, you know, it's we too go. much. We've had too much mm -hmm. on tech. Tech is still toward the top of our sector rotation model. Uh, healthcare and consumer staples are also really? up there. So it's a little bit of a mix uh, in terms of growth versus value, defensive versus um, more uh, uh, risky names for sure. Right. Um, the stuff at the bottom of the scorecard, though, is all the super hyper defensive right. stuff. Like real estate, not a great place for us. The utilities still toward the bottom or, or lower in the right. scorecard. Communications is a sector we're watching really carefully, as well as financials. Gina. These are sectors that have been making some big moves. We don't care what you think. All we want to know is what Oscar Hernandez Tejada thinks. Okay. Berkeley Economics, fancy degree from the Johns Hopkins at University. Good choice on that, Oscar. What's he say on NVIDIA? No idea what Oscar says on NVIDIA. I can't comment on NVIDIA. Uh, what I can say is from our perspective on NVIDIA, certainly an important stock to watch in the U.S., but we've already seen some really interesting rotation out of the Mag Magnificent Seven. Uh, lots of distribution in the Magnificent Seven toward the rest of the index. I think NVIDIA will be very important to setting a tone, but what's happening outside of NVIDIA is now the probably the most important part of the equity market. Can we gather momentum outside of NVIDIA, outside yeah. of the Magnificent Seven? We have a new um, group of stocks that we're calling the Great Eight or the largest eight stocks in China. Yeah. which have also started to create a massive burst in activity. So yeah. I think we're starting to see a lot more Dana Chelsea in retail is heated about that. She says the China gloom's way, way overdone. I would completely right. agree. We th when we thought right. this coming into this okay. year and, and Chinese okay. stocks very predictably <laughs> bottomed you, at a multiple that they always can bottomed you help at. Us? Can you get Mark Gurman and Oscar Hernandez Tejada to get out of bed early? <laughs> yeah, they're sure. out on the left coast <laughs> and they're, they're just absolutely useless. Gina Martin Adams, thank you so much. This has been great. Sure. And we'll look on Bloomberg Intelligence today after the NVIDIA report to what uh, Mr. Tejada uh, says. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom. Paul and Lisa, primary elections were held yesterday in Georgia, Idaho, Kentucky, and Oregon. Republican slim majority in the House just got a little more breathing room after a special election in California. 
Bloomberg government's Jonathan Tamari has more. This was the special. This was the special election to replace Kevin McCarthy, the former speaker who was ousted by his own party and then resigned at the end of last year. Uh, but one of his former top former aides is going to replace him, Vince Fong. He was a, a state representative and had worked for Kevin McCarthy in his office previously. It'll give Republicans just a tiny bit more leeway in the House. They still don't have a lot of room to maneuver. It's a 218 to 213 split in the House now. Bloomberg government's Jonathan Tamari in Washington. According to a Bloomberg News morning consult poll, half of swing state voters say they're worried about violence this presidential election. Six in 10 swing state voters, mostly Democrats, are worried about misinformation. Norway, Spain, and Ireland have announced that they are recognizing a Palestinian state. Ireland's Prime Minister Simon Harris announced the move in a press conference today. Last month I stood on these same steps with Prime Minister Sanchez of Spain and we said that the point of recognizing the state of Palestine was coming closer. That point has now arrived. Israel's foreign minister recalled ambassadors from Norway and Ireland and said the recognition makes a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas less likely. Lawyers in former President Trump's classified documents case are due in court today for the first time since the judge indefinitely postponed the trial earlier this month. U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon will hear arguments on a Trump request to dismiss the indictment. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, Lisa. By popular acclaim and demand by Paul Sweeney. <laughs> There it is, John Tesh. John it seems Tesh? a little dated to me. I guess I gotta re-record it. You I know, that's it doesn't sound like are you ready for some football? And by the way, if people out there go see the video on YouTube of John Tesh doing this. It's amazing. dated. You know, <laughs> it's, 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 just, it's a little dated. But he is into it and I'm who's not into okay, John he's Tesh? He's into it, but but you know, you think they'd come up with something, you know, more modern NBA. I, I, I guess is how I do it. But John Tesh, according to his social media, he is on call. The orchestra for NBC is on to call. Take NBA NB from TNT. Yep, he'll be ready to go. But NBC, for its part, says, "Oh, us asking John Tesh to re-record this has nothing to do with our right. potential to get the NBA rights." Yeah, we're going we're so to have to see. Into it. I, good morning, Ed Ludlow. I, I hope you're up with uh, Mr. Tahada of Bloomberg Intelligence, Mark Gurman. <coughs> uh, the, yep. the West Coast gets up a little later. We'll see sure, if we... no problem. You know, we'll see if we uh, I, I get him in here as well. My son just <coughs> moved to L.A. for his job, which is with a big financial institution, and very I told cool. him right, very cool. that you're going to be on New York hours, dude. So good luck with that. <laughs> it's a chore. It's like, it's, it it, it's a different, it's different than what we do, like the 4 a.m. thing. I know hundreds of know. people that work on the West Coast and financial service, and not <clears throat> one has said they ever got used to the hours. Yeah, you never get used to it. There's no, no question about that. Good morning to PIMCO. They've been very helpful. Tony Crescenzi in with us last week uh, was great uh, as well. Futures of the deteriorate, negative 9. Dow futures, negative 88. We're making jokes about it, but seriously, this NVIDIA announcement this afternoon has captured the imagination of so many. We're really looking forward to a conversation on uh, NVIDIA, the VIX 12.05. From New York City on YouTube with Lisa Mateo, Bloomberg Surveillance.
Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Dow futures down two tenths of a percent at 39,918. SP futures down a tenth of a percent at 5,366. And we have NASDAQ futures little changed at 18,799. To the bond market, the two year yield 4.86%, up three basis points. The yield on the 10 year 4.45%, up three basis points. To commodity spot gold, lower 2,410 an ounce. We have uh, Brent crude $81 a barrel, WTI crude $77 a barrel. Some tough news for Tesla, down more than 1%. It got off to a sluggish start for the second quarter in Europe, where Elon Musk was expecting a much better showing than the first few months of the year. And then shares of BuzzFeed, they are soaring. They're up 56% right now. Former U.S. presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy reported a 7.7% stake in the company. And finally, Axios reporting presidential candidate Robert Kennedy Jr. Junior just bought $24,000 worth of GameStop shares. Those shares down a percent. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, uh, thanks so much. On NVIDIA this afternoon, an intelligent conversation with Edward Ludlow, Bloomberg Technology. He's been doing a lot of good things for us, including his wonderful interview with Michael Dell and company the other day. Ed Ludlow, when in doubt, go to the annual report, NVIDIA. Accelerated data centers could save an incredible 19 terawatt hours of electricity annually if run on GPU and DPU accelerators versus CPU. They go on to talk about the NVIDIA ecosystem. Can anyone compete with them? So far, no. I mean, it, it, the simplest explanation is just to do the numbers as we have them for 2024. So NVIDIA will sell $40 billion worth of high-performance GPUs or AI accelerators this year. AMD has raised its forecast to say it will sell $4.5 billion, so 10x less. And Intel's nowhere to be seen. They might do $500 million. And that is why we define this afternoon's earnings report as the mother of all earnings, the most important stock in the planet, uh, Goldman in February. Uh, it is the be all and end all of this earnings season. Um, and it's, you know, it's more than 5% of, of right. in waiting terms of the S&P 500. So brace for a macro event. See, you know, Ludlow's never had a gray hair. <laughs> no. he, what he just said, Paul, all my radar is up. I know. All I know. my radar is up. I'm I know. sorry. We drive some electric vehicles. It's the be all and end all. He entrusts like the driving thing on this electric vehicle, like to go over the Golden Gate Bridge. Are you nuts? With that, with I would his hands that. aren't on the wheel? That's what, no, he's just kicking back. I don't know what he's doing. But NVIDIA stock, just to give you a sense, $2.3 trillion market cap, up 92% yeah. this year, up 200% on a trailing 12-month basis. So, Ed, I guess that's a long way of saying the bar's pretty high for this company and this management team today. What do you think they need to say on this call? The, the bar is very high, but it's been high every quarter going back the last six to eight quarters. Um, I think that, that the big question is, is there a market beyond the status quo, which is NVIDIA sells its AI accelerators to a very small group of companies, which is the hyperscalers, uh, Amazon, AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Platform, <coughs> and some right. of the bigger tech companies like Meta. But we've not moved beyond that. You know, the, if this is to endure, they need to state explicitly that they're selling a uh, large volume of AI accelerators to smaller companies or different kinds of companies um, because a lot of their addressable market forecasts are predicated on the idea that everyone is going to be running com um, AI workloads right. on, on some kind of server that's powered by NVIDIA. And Jensen Wang, he, he, he wears the white sole shoes like you wear. I mean, it's like, yeah. it's like a uniform. He does. Out there. <laughs> Compare Jensen Wang when, when he's doing the conference call today we say Morris Chang at Taiwan Semi, or Mr. Jobs, or Mr. Cook, or Mr. Nadella, fit how this guy's unique versus other CEOs, besides he wears white sole shoes like Ed Ludlow. 
Well, you, you, what, what he is, is is kind of the classic Silicon Valley founder CEO. You know, the backstory in NVIDIA is well told. It was founded in a Denny's. The original ambition was to make high-performance GPUs for to power the graphics behind video games in the early days of video games. It, it, it is still unusual in this day and age for a founder to carry on as CEO. He's kind of centralized power. You know, there are a few of them out there, Mark Zuckerberg being a rare example. And differently to, to, to TSMC's founders and leadership, Jensen does embrace the personality and the character. You know, he has his identity, right? Leather jacket wearing, white soled shoes. Yes, you know, that is all deliberate. He is the rock star of the technology sector at the moment. Um, and, and what he's very good at, much like Elon Musk, is keep, keeping you looking to the horizon, saying things are amazing right now, but in the future they'll be even more amazing, and here's how we think that will happen. It's just classic Silicon Valley stuff. Um, difference between him and many others, he actually delivers on the top and bottom line every quarter. So as I look at the PGEO function and breaking up the revenue yeah. where it comes from, uh, back in their fiscal 2020 year, it was 70% graphics, 30% networking. Now it's like the exact opposite. It's the compute and networking business. So this is really, this company's transformed itself into this, uh, in this AI play almost exclusively, haven't they? It, it really has, and I, I reflect back on Monday in the interview that I did with Michael Dell and Jensen Huang sat next to each other. What is a bit awkward between them is that NVIDIA right now sells products, high-performance GPUs and some of the other gear that goes into the servers, that goes into data centers. And it needs Dell to package that up. It needs Dell to help sell in areas that right. they don't have sales experience. But the question is, they won't need them forever. You know, NVIDIA wants to become a systems vendor and do it all itself, and including the software that powers those data centers. And I think consensus is that they're getting much closer to that vision. Um, and so not only is, is the data center business the, the, the sort of mainstay, but right. they're going to even boost margins even further by doing other stuff. Ed Ludlow, your focus on Microsoft Copilot Plus PCs. Yeah. You're kidding me, they're going to compete with Apple? Yeah, I, I'm really interested in this because there are all these PCs came out this week. I, I count like maybe uh, a couple dozen models. Some of them are, are very expensive. Uh, like two grand, three grand, like who's paying three grand for a laptop? But some of them are more affordable, $1,000. I don't know the answer yet. I keep asking the question to executives, like, do we need AI PCs and what do they actually do? What do they so what do? I'll tell you is that, well, what I'll do is this, Tom, I'm going to go away for a few weeks and I'm going to play with many AI PCs and I'll report back. But the basic idea is that it's a PC that when you open ChatGPT on it or another chatbot, it doesn't crash. In other words, the semiconductor makers have designed chips right. that can go in at a reasonable <clears throat> price point and allow you to do things on your laptop. Um, and right. the idea is that it makes you more well, efficient and productive. Is he, is he talking to Scarlett next week? Maybe. I think yeah. Ludlow yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, he's huge. He's like a player out there. Where are you on the litigation of Scarlett? She's going to go after open AI. I mean, copyright matters, Ed Ludlow. Oh, you mean Scarlett Johansson? I thought yeah, you meant Scarlett Fu. I was no, like, well, no, Fu yeah, is I huge. mean, I mean, you can't talk to Scarlett Fu, but that's a th th this is this is a massive story. So uh, the voice that OpenAI gave in its updated uh, bot is eerily and weirdly similar to Scarlett Johansson. Scarlett Johansson comes out and says, I was approached twice by OpenAI and I rejected their offer to be the voice of their their AI assistant. So I, it's going to be so interesting to to hear what happens because OpenAI is a smallish company, still 1,300 employees, but they kind of think oh, they're unstoppable. All no, this no, is I'm about, serious. But this is about <laughs> copyright of Bloomberg. It's about copyright of the New York Times. It's about 100%. copyright of the Telegraph. I mean, we haven't even had this discussion in your world yet, which is basically stealing the copyright of news, right? Yes, but in this case, specifically the identity of an individual where there's a paper trail where according to Scarlett Johansson, she was approached twice formally Johansson. and rejected them, but they, whether they did it or not anyway, will, the courts maybe will right. decide, but it's, a, it's an amazing right. uh, circumstance to follow. Are you wearing your white-soled shoes right now, Ed? 
for our YouTube audience, I'm not going to lift my legs above the anchor's <laughs> desk, but I, can't I, I am wearing my white soled shoes today. Yeah, Lisa could put her feet on the ceiling if she wants. She's so yep. cut and chiseled. Yep. Yep. I'm not going to do that either. And thank you for letting us all. Great briefing and priceless. Ed Ludlow with Bloomberg at Technology, leading here. And of course, yep. you'll be paying attention to the NVIDIA earnings this afternoon. Of course, that with Carol and Ted, with Tim, I should say, out. Uh, red and green on the screen, NASDAQ up fractionally. From New York City, we need to get the markets open. Bloomberg surveillance. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo alongside Tom Keenan and Paul Sweeney with your opening bell report. Well, there really hasn't been much movement in the markets before the bell. Investors are a little bit jittery about the prospect of stubbornly high inflation, especially after more Fed speak that kind of lean toward needing more data before making any cuts. And then, yes, we also have NVIDIA reporting after the close. So let's see how things are shaping up in midweek trading. Starting with the S&P 500, right now it is little change at 5,316, down four basis.
points, four points. And then we go to the Dow. That's little change at 39,843, down 32 points. And finally, the NASDAQ, and that is little change at 16,838, up six points. Over to the bond market, the two-year yield at 4.86%. That's up three basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.44%, and that's up two basis points. To commodities, we have spot gold lower, 2,409 an ounce. Brent crude, $82 a barrel. WTI crude, $77 a barrel. Since we mentioned NVIDIA, let's check it at the open. Right now, it is up about two-tenths of a percent. That is your Bloomberg opening bell report. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. Greatly appreciate it. Our next guest is wildly eclectic. He is encyclopedic, for example, on ADXY, which is the Pacific Rim Currency Matrix X Japan. Uh, he looks at the equity markets. He looks at economics. And Paul, I'm sorry, it gets my attention when Michael Purvis leads his <laughs> research with the VIX. Exactly. And he knows the audience he's speaking to. Michael Purvis joins us. He's the CEO and founder of Talbach and Capital Advisors uh, joining us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Michael, a lot of folks say, you know, longer term for a, a healthy market, you need a pullback of 5, 10, 15, 20 percent every now and again to kind of just reset everything. Was that five-ish percent pullback we had in April? Was that it for us? Are we I, I was actually back that I was expecting we might get a little bit more, maybe down to 4,800. But uh, look, we have a, an extraordinarily strong risk on set up, and uh, that's from sort of the macro side. But from the company side, the corporate earnings have been really strong, not just yeah. with tech, and you know, which is a core pillar of, of the equity complex. But you know, if you look at uh, the 11 um, industry groups within the S&P 500, uh, Nine of them had higher margins in this quarter than they were than they had in the prior quarter there, and those margins are in, in many cases at lifetime highs there. So everyone's expecting you know some sort of like okay you know with inflation margins are going to contract. Well they didn't. Then defl you know you get lower inflation then margins are going to contract, right? There's always a margin contraction story, but companies you know you have to take your hat off to them because they've really been able to navigate this yep. strange economic cycle really well and continue to ge generate uh, strong earnings growth and keep that going there. So, um, you know, th the combination of those two factors combined with, you know, I call it dual Goldilocks, where you have a Fed that did this dovish uh, pivot in December. Now, it comes with a million footnotes, that pivot, yep. but it is, it is, and it's being walked back. But they're, you know, look, right now, Paul, the, the hawking case is doing nothing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, <coughs> at the May meeting, Powell walled off optionality on the hike, on the hiking side. When when coming into that meeting, there was only one cut that was priced in 24, right? So basically, the Dove case is anything, any any cuts, and the Hawk case is doing nothing. Right. So. All right. So we were just talking about Target all morning, and Target just red headline crossing the Bloomberg terminal. Target shares sink 10 percent in biggest drop since wow. November 2022. So we'll keep an eye on that. Michael, uh, Tom's been talking about this. It makes a ton of sense to me. Maybe it's just a case of out there in this market, particularly since October, there just aren't a lot of sellers out there. I mean, you know, you've got a Fed, I guess, presumably, as you mentioned, is going to be cutting rates. And as you mentioned, we had a pretty strong earnings season. So why fight the tape, I guess? I, I you know, it's a cliche, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's also a truism. I mean, look, a year, just a year ago, it's not that long ago when everyone was, uh, well, call it a year and a half ago, everyone was massively bared up coming into the year. Mm -hmm. Not everyone. Um, but but a lot of a lot of real money was long bonds and short equities or light equities, and that ended up being those people were were upside down both ways. And that, you know, for a hedge fund they can reposition quickly, right? But for big long only allocators who have, are more like the battleships turning around, um, those that that process takes a while, and there's probably still some residual that, and it's all being endorsed by the again this combination of of a constructive macro environment. Right. And, uh, and strong corporate results. Uh, we protect the copyright of all of our guests. No, you're not going to get the tall back and uh, uh, report from me. And in it is eight, nine charts of brilliance on volatility in the VIX. Go beyond the media fixation on VIX yeah. to what volatility charts are really saying right now. Yeah, well, I think it's, I think what Tom, what you're touching on is the, the sort of the cross asset <laughs> volatility picture is is really interesting right now because um, FX balls are collapsing. <coughs> uh, uh, rate vol is finally really getting lower again. 
oil vol even, right, uh, is, is, is really pretty low. The only vol that's kind of really spiking recently has been gold vol, but that's pretty niche yeah. um, uh, there. And it does that when it rallies um, uh, there. But you're, so why, why are all these vols coming down, right? So let's start with the Fed. You know, and the and the and the markets with the Fed. So basically, over the last five months, we've the markets have gone from seven cuts to one cut. They kind of framed out the min max condition for hiking. So now we're really in the tweaking zone there, right? Um, so that is ultimately means that whatever adjustments the bond market needs to make with Fed messaging that we that we'll be getting, you know, for, uh, throughout the, right. the rest of the year will be much smaller adjustments than, than what we've had earlier. If that the, means lower if, bond vol. If the doom glue crew says we're going to get slower growth, they go back to economics and Fed speak and yeah. all that. Can we get slower economic growth, but with inflation where nominal GDP saves the day for the equity market? Yeah, I mean, look, corporate earnings are, 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 you know, when we go to Starbucks, we buy coffee with nominal dollars, not real dollars, right? And that's <laughs> reflected in, 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 uh, uh, in, in, you know, in nominal earnings there. So, look, I think the question is, is what is the complexion of nominal GDP? Are we looking at too much inflation and too little growth, right? Um, you know, the, and, and, you know, if you go back to the extreme cases of the 70s, you had sometimes you know, uh, no growth and 150, per, you know, like whatever nominal GDP was, was entirely or more than entirely driven by inflation. That's real stagflation. If you look at the last two years, we never got to anything like those ratios there, right? So what's been encouraging this year is, is that if you look at the consensus forecast per Bloomberg, the percentage of nominal GDP composed of growth has been climbing. That may slow down a little bit, but it's still nowhere near a stagflationary condition there. So I think this uh, is so important, Paul. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. That's why, that's why we, have we, we, we have to remember nominal <laughs> GDP is really, really important. And now it's my broader strategic, you know, view, long, longer term view that we have been undergoing a shift to a higher nominal GDP condition than what we've lived in in the few years before COVID hit. Right. I think that's just happening. And there's a lot of implications there um, uh, for markets, for rates, and so forth, right? But I think that's what's happening here, is that higher stickier floor for inflation, but that also comes most likely with some growth. And, I, I and can't, we've seen growth and inflation surprise to the upside. What you just yeah. heard there with Michael Purvis, folks, is the arch debate here of the gloom crew just saying we're going to have slow, slow economic growth and people like Mr. Purvis pushing against it, to yep. say the least. Michael, it's interesting this year, we started the year discounting maybe six or seven rate cuts. Now we're, throughout the year, we've kind of t tempered that down, now maybe one or two rate cuts. Despite that tempered rate cut environment, the S&P is up 11%. Sure. Yeah. How did that happen? You know, if you go back through time, there's periods of very high sort of equity valuation sensitivity to interest rates, and there's periods where it's very low. And we went through extremely high <clears throat> sensitivity in 2022. Yeah. Um, and 2021, beat. and the, the other way, right? Rates yep. went crazy low, PEs expanded, and then we reversed that. And th th those, those were periods of very, very high uh, interest rate slash uh, PE sensitivity. And you, ha you had a very elevated correlation in the years before COVID, too. It was extreme in, in, during COVID. But there, and now we're, been, I mean, I think the whole story, what we started learning a year ago, and we continue to learn, is that we're going into a low correlation period where it's really about, okay, of all the ups and downs of where the S&P uh, PE should be, we're kind of settling in on that, right? And it's sort of like kind of framed out. It's really, if you're an equity bull, you need to be bullish on the earnings story, right? Yep, yep. It's not about PE expansion. It's really not about PE contraction. That doesn't mean there's not certain PEs that are overdone or underdone, of course. But but broadly speaking, this is we're now in a period where it's an earnings-driven rally. If you go, Tom, if you go back to the uh, you know 2011 to 2019 rally, it was 50 percent of that was PE expansion against the most aggressive central banking we've ever right. seen, right? And mm -hmm. now we're doing something different. This has been great. Yep. What a break from NVIDIA. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Purvis, thank you so much for Tolbach. And we got through that entire conversation, and we didn't talk about NVIDIA. Right. Just Again, time. Carol and Tim are going to break that down for you uh, this afternoon okay. when it crosses the tape. We'll have to see. All right. Michael Purvis, thank you. Red and green on the screen, NASDAQ up fractionally. With our news in New York City, M. Barr.
Thank you very much, Tom. Paul, Lisa, Ireland, Norway, and Spain announced they would recognize a Palestinian state. Israel condemned the move and recalled its ambassadors from Norway and Ireland. Growing support for Palestinian statehood continues. The U.S. backs a negotiated two-state solution. Ambassador to Qatar, Timmy Davis. The two-state solution uh, is the only answer. Uh, it is not a frivolous thing. It will take all of us to do it, uh, but we have to do it. Ambassador Davis spoke today at a security conference in Doha. A deadly tornado outbreak in Iowa Tuesday is blamed for several deaths. Iowa State Patrol says the twister hit the city of Greenfield hard. State Patrol Public Information Officer Sergeant Alex Dinkla says at least a dozen people were transported to area hospitals. The team at the Adair County Memorial Hospital worked swiftly to assist the injured while also assuring safety of their facility as it also sustained tornado damage. Due to the hospital damage, patients were needing to be transported for their injuries to nearby area hospitals. Police say they expect to release more information about the number of dead later today. The rapid emergence of artificial intelligence has swing state voters worried about the impact of AI's growing presence. Bloomberg's Amy Morris reports from Washington. The Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll finds more than half of respondents in seven battleground states predicted a negative impact from AI on privacy, just about half seeing a future negative impact on jobs. At the same time, artificial intelligence was also seen as having positive impacts on health by 45 percent and on education by 41 percent. The poll also found majority support for efforts to ban TikTok if its Beijing-based parent company fails to divest. In Washington, Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Daily marijuana use is now more common than similar levels of drinking in the U.S. That's according to an analysis of national surveyed data over four decades. The study's author says alcohol is still more widely used, but 2022 was the first time an intensive level of marijuana use overtook high-frequency drinking. Jonathan Culkins is a researcher at Carnegie Mellon University. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom Paul, Lisa. Michael Barr, thanks so much. The Red Sox beat the Pirates 8-1 to one on April 19th. Yeah. Remember the gloom on <laughs> Apple, April China? Oh, boy. Yeah. It's all, it's ending. It's over. I don't have an, an angle here, folks. Buy, hold, sell. Apple's up 17% off of April 19th. Yeah, I don't know. How, how do you, I, I don't, you know, we, we try to get conversation with competent people. I don't know what you do besides that. Because if you follow the gloom flow, it's dangerous. Well, it is. But I, I tell you, Apple has got a fundamental issue with China. I, I, I think it's going to be a headwind for this stock, company in the stock for a while. Not that the stock can't perform, but... You know, if you're buying the stock today, you have to be comfortable that they are going to be able to sell a lot of stuff into China. Simple as that. And uh, at this point, it's unclear whether can, they can, whether that market, if, 20 percent of revenue, can be a growth market. If Nvidia today, over the wall, over the turnpike, yep. over the cask and flagon, <laughs> lands almost on the bridge to Kenmore Square, what does the market do? I don't. Know, boy, I mean, it's. I, you could say the performance we had in the stock market in 2023 uh, was due in part, in measurable part, to the whole AI, you know, kind of aura there, because it's just spreading beyond tech to all different types of industries yeah. and companies. And <clears throat> I don't know what happens if that turns around and goes the other way. Chris, thanks for the comment. Doomer's going to doom, that's all. Yep. <laughs> We're trying to avoid that. Bloomberg surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Right now we have the S&P 500, little change, same for the Dow and the NASDAQ. With the NASDAQ at 16,838, the Dow 39,860, the S&P 500 5,320. The bond market, two-year yield at 4.86%, up three basis points. The 10-year yield, 4.42%, up one basis point. What's moving the markets? Target down 9%. Comparable sales declined for the fourth quarter in a row. And then you have shares of Petco. They're up 31%. You reported better than expected first quarter results and gave that forecast that beat expectations. And then shares of BuzzFeed, they are soaring up 67%. Yeah, the former U.S. presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, he reported a stake in the company. That's the reason for that. And we told you earlier how BHP was on this deadline to make another offer for Anglo-American or walk away for it. Well, it looks like they made the offer, but Anglo-American rejected it, extended Ending the deadline, but BHP is saying that increased offer was its final. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much. Greatly, greatly uh, appreciate that. Uh, Lisa Mateo, again, she's out live chat on YouTube. Lisa's winding up. She's doing a course this afternoon. Really? Yeah, she's like, you know, down in the basement. You okay. Know, on the floor above Home Depot, and she's in some like two hour course. How to, how to do YouTube watch. Sure. Oh they, I went to the meeting Strong and, social media. and they asked me to leave. They said, yeah. <laughs> they said it's hopeless. We're on YouTube. Subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast. Search Bloomberg Podcasts. And again, there's a great live chat. Lisa Mateo joins today, which is a good uh, and, and, and beautiful uh, thing. In 1967-68, the head coach of the Boston Celtics was one B. Russell. Red Arbach smoked a cigar in the yeah. garden. That's how things have uh, changed. Uh, let me go to the 67-68 season, which Greg Villiers remembers. NBA champions defeated Lakers 4-2. to two. He remembers the Boston Celtics of another time. Greg Vallier joins with AGF. Um, I mean, Greg, with, with the Celtics being like the best out there, but there's really no parallel to the 67-68 Boston Celtics. No, first of all, good to hear your voice, Tom. And uh, the Celtics did not deserve to win last night. I'll take it <laughs> since I'm a, I'm a big fan, but they didn't uh, okay. deserve to win. Did no, the 60s were, were awesome. The Celtics were, were one of the most dominant teams in the history of American sports. Do the Democrats deserve to win in Chicago <laughs> this summer, uh, a la 1968? I mean, there's a lot of stress out there about these conventions, aren't there, Greg? Absolutely. I think that there will be protests. The, the Democrats have to be concerned that Joe Biden, after a little spurt around the State of the Union address, has gone back to not being real impressive. Uh, I tell everyone, uh, Tom, that if the election were held tonight, Donald Trump would win. I mean, the election is still about six months away, so a lot is going to change. But as of right now, Trump is the favorite. So, again, as you talk to your clients, Greg, what do you, how do you think this is going to play out over the next, again, as you mentioned, we still got a long way to, to go to November. How do you think this is going to play out? Well, let me say this, Paul. There, there are two things that the markets don't like and will get regardless of who wins. Number one, staggering deficits. Neither uh, Trump nor uh, Biden are particularly concerned about red ink. They, they'll let the deficits run. So we'll continue at about $2 trillion a year cannot be sustained, but both of them will try to do it. The other thing that you'll get regardless of who wins is trade protectionism with China. I thought this was a Trump issue. Yeah. And lo and behold, in April, uh, Joe Biden goes to Pennsylvania and talks about enormous new tariffs on the Chinese. So these are two issues the markets don't like, and they're going to get them regardless of who wins. So I, I, how do you suggest investors kind of position themselves for what is still a race that I don't think anybody's really willing to call at this point. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that since both of them are notorious for gaffes, they're good for a gaff a day. <laughs> so it, 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 it's hard. Yesterday, Trump said that he hadn't decided his policy on birth control, uh, not abortion, birth control. I think we settled that maybe 50 years ago. 
Well, so they're they're both good for gas. So it, you're right. It's hard for the markets to really uh, to to really make any kind of uh, play. Yeah. Uh, I think this is going to be an election of momentum. There's going to be four, five, six, seven momentum shifts uh, that we can't accurately predict. Are there some issues that you think the candidates should be focused on? Whether it's it's the border wall, whether it's the economy, whether yeah. it's geopolitics. It seems like uh, there's a lot out there for these candidates to talk about if if uh, Joe Biden loses I think the, in the postmortem you'll have to put I immigration high on the list of yeah. things that the White House did not handle well they didn't really uh, get a plan until yeah. a few months ago uh, I think mm -hmm. also if, if Trump should lose it will right. maybe largely be abortion Greg what do the Democrats do with dinos, Democrats in name only. I mean, I'm fascinated by the classic Reagan run to the center. Biden comfortably yeah. wants to run to the center. All sorts of good writing, Ezra Klein and others this weekend yeah. that he's shifted progressive. What are the Democrats in name only doing? Right now, not not a lot. They, 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 they took a look at uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and I think that over yeah. the next few weeks, yeah. Kennedy will fade. I, I don't see him as, as as big a factor as many other analysts are saying. So there are a lot of Democrats who have not decided. It'll depend on how egregious the gaffes are in the next few months. Oh, but come on, at the end of October, I mean, this thing is, you know, it's going to be Labor Day, the right. conventions, Cavalier is going to be on eight days a week. <laughs> and it's, it's all great, Greg. But the bottom line is the third week of October, Republicans in name only and Democrats in name only, Agnew's silent majority has to make a choice. Their choice is, are they going to show up at the voting booth? Are they? Uh, probably if you're Hispanic, a young person or African-American, probably not in the numbers that uh, that Biden would like to see. Uh, I think, I hate to be cliched, Tom, but in the final analysis, it's the economy. Tell me what inflation is. If inflation is still in the high twos, Biden is in real trouble. If the economy is looking uh, better, well, maybe Biden's got a chance. But it right. all, as usual, right. it all boils down to the economy. Greg, you got an opinion on NVIDIA? We're desperate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't. I'm sorry. Can't help you on that. Thank you. The best interview of the day. Greg <laughs> Millier without an opinion on NVIDIA with AGF and just a legendary and important uh, morning note as well. I got to, you know, we're making jokes about it, but there I'm going to be. I mean, for whatever. Yep. Beverage of my choice yep. in my hand. Sure. Kennel fee on my lap. <laughs> vet bill at my feet. Waiting for NVIDIA, like right. everybody else. Right, and I'm going to go to Top Live on the Bloomberg <coughs> Terminal because they're going to break it down they will. They will uh, break, yes. with some of the they greatest uh, voices in Bloomberg News who follow this company in this industry as well. So we'll see. But again, it's uh, clearly given the stock's performance, you know, up 90% this year, over 200% over the past right. 12 months. The market obviously has a very <laughs> high bar uh, for this company, and they've surpassed that bar for the last three right. or four quarters. And the question will be, can they do it? Again. Right. A man with a cell phone from 2007 joining us now, John Tucker. John, NVIDIA, you're all over it, right? <laughs> what do they do again? <laughs> what do they do again? <laughs> yeah, it? absolutely. Yeah, I mean, sure. It's like it's, it's NVIDIA Day. We're all, we're all told, in maybe. a holding pattern until uh, after yeah. the regular close of market trading it's today. Be interesting. I mean, I have an opinion, but I'm, a, you know, I'm about as informed <laughs> as, you know, you know. What about the derivative of plays? Not just NVIDIA. That's so obvious. But like, you know. The other chip makers are both trading well uh, this year. Um, software plays. You know, people will talk Microsoft and some other things. And, and if you talk to Alex Steele, she will bring in the energy angle because you need to power up all these data centers and all that kind of stuff and all the computers. Um, and that's what the utilities are talking about. Utilities have had a nice run this year in part on the AI play, believe it or not, Tom. Did yeah. you see that Amazon's going to charge you for a little extra for Alexa when Alexa embraces artificial intelligence? <clears throat> right. Really? Uh, at yeah. least according to CNBC. There you go. Okay. John Tucker, thank you so much for this. Sometimes your kids give you, like, people, you know, new people to listen to in music. A couple years ago, they're like, listen to Ellie Goulding. I mean, she's, like, from London and okay. very British poppy and all that. I liked it. Ellie Goulding. Burn. Ellie, good morning. NVIDIA this afternoon.
we gonna let it burn, burn, burn. 